some reason, I mean, it's it's a very innocuous site, Jay Dyer, what is jaysanalysis.com. Actually, the only site that I could think of that I have a paid membership for, except for one other uh, car forum thing, um, Jay, jaysanalysis.com. Highly recommend you guys check it out. He's got a YouTube channel. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about exactly what we talked about last time. I titled it, uh, The Alchemy of the Soy Boy, Green Revolution, Starving Ourselves to Save the Planet. Uh, and we're going to talk about all kinds of fun stuff. I've got some videos pulled up. Uh, we, could just, we could just riff as well. This is my first broadcast with headphones on. Sorry if, if I get confused. DJ Meat. <laughs> yeah. DJ Brain Eater over here. Um, DJ Steak. Damn, look at look at Jay with the soy juice. What's up with that? What are you drinking? Well, you know, I've had a lot of complaints about having such a large member. I thought I would try to shrink things a little bit, make it a little easier on the girls. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm awesome. I'm drinking just straight soy today. Straight soy juice, nice. Well, that's good. If it's in its raw and uh, and an unprocessed form, I hear soy is just fantastic for the, uh, for the well. Donuts. This is this is raw processed GMO soy. Oh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. Most seems, like, seems like you're taking Osho's uh, advice there. Um, Don't say bad about him. Nothing bad about Osho. <laughs> He'll attack again. <laughs> Dude, it's funny how Osho's kind of like this cultural figure still. I can't believe how popular that guy's become. Yeah, YouTube for some reason helped with that a lot. I see his videos pop up on YouTube, and uh, uh, I remember I still haven't seen the whole documentary series on him, but uh, you know, he did have a pretty sophisticated surveillance system going, so he was he was taping things and kind of he was running some kind of operation there that I don't I, I think suggests that he had help from other people. It wasn't just his own little operation. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I took away too. I don't know. I mean, I'm always kind of maybe connecting things that uh, that other people aren't connecting, but absolutely, man, the surveillance equipment they had those hidden rooms, and yeah. then the. Uh, well, a lot of the Hollywood connections were interesting as well. I know you're a yeah. scholar on Laurel Canyon. Um, I don't know. The end of that that documentary was kind of nauseating near the end. They did a good job with editing and music and stuff on that. Was it Wild Wild Country? Um, but, you know, actually meeting Oshoites is interesting. Have you met any former Osho people? I have not. Tell me about it. They like, uh, they're very touchy feely, but there's this, there's a specific zonkedness, like a specific thing, like in their eyes, <laughs> this kind of blank, uh, I don't know. I mean, you, when you go to like hippie festivals and stuff, which you mm -hmm. just did, it's kind of a similar thing. Um, hard to describe, but they've all got the similar gloss. There's a rainbow ho, ho, around the moon. You sent so me intermittent, that. intermittently, I'm going to break out with that throughout the entire That'll be helpful. show and ruin it. For scholarly purposes. So, so, dude, I don't know. I like talking to Jay because Jay's the kind of guy who I can pull up any video and play it. And he'll be laughing in a similar way and probably be connecting things in a similar way and probably be able to go far deeper in his explanation um, on, on why these things are so funny, so interesting, so ironic. But... Um, I've got a lot of stimulus pulled up here. I've got a bunch of potential videos we can watch. But first yeah. of all, I'd like to maybe just ask you a few things on your thoughts on the history of the Green Revolution. And we're seeing a lot of talk. Like, I mean, Trudeau came out the other day, and he's talking about uh, climate taxes, uh, paying taxes to the international. Justin Trudeau? Uh, Justin Trudeau, right? <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. Justin Trudeau. Kevin Trudeau's the the... Natural cures con man. I was making a joke. <laughs> yeah, dude. No, I actually do. I just remembered that I, I, his face popped up the second time he said his name. Is he in jail? He, he got locked up, didn't he? I think he is in jail for. He went. He fled to Switzerland and they uh, tracked him down for, I don't know, tax evasion or something. I don't know. But, I wonder what he's selling inside inside prison. Like <laughs> he's, <laughs> got, he's got na he's got natural uh, jail implements like natural uh homemade jail like shank removal enemas yeah like shank <laughs> there you go or uh or uh organic orange slice wine yeah. made from <laughs> made from uh purified toilet water <laughs> shout out to the trudeau family i wonder if they're if they're related but anyways yeah so you had we had uh, the leader of of the free world above america and 
Yeah, uh, Justin, not Justin Trudeau. Yeah, Justin Trudeau announcing <laughs> how we need carbon. I'm all yeah. freaking <laughs> wrapped up now in these Trudeaus. Talking about carbon taxes uh, as a way to save yeah. the planet. I've got some <laughs> some news articles pulled up. Huge reduction in meat, essential to avoid climate yes. breakdown. You know, The Guardian, we've got The Atlantic. All these propaganda outlets are telling us that eating meat's bad, that we've got to stop having the babies for the earth, for the, the mama Gaia. Where does all this stuff come from, man? What do you see this as? You, you, I know you studied philosophy deeply. I mean, you, you got a master's degree in philosophy, right? Uh, yes, all but thesis, yes. Okay. So, and I the mean, thesis is half finished. I walked out in the middle of the thesis. Oh, how nice of you. <laughs> um, so, and yeah, that's man. That's a different story. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I don't want to rehash too much of what we talked about last time because we did. I did mention Plato and all that. Mm. So it goes back to the ancient world, you know, giving the slaves grain and orphan slop basically uh if you think of pink floyd videos play so could have some more and you, you know you get orphan slop no you can't have meat how can you have your pudding if you can't eat your meat but you don't get meat you get slop <laughs> well, that's anyway uh so it's not uh it's not something new and then i think we talked about last time uh the Tavstar corporate uh, Tavstock Institute mm -hmm. and uh, when I just gave my talk in, in LA we talked a lot about Tavistock they wanted me to come speak about social engineering and all that which was very interesting because this was a big time vegan crowd and I didn't mm -hmm. talk about veganism I talked about feeding the slaves the vegan slop how was that received and uh, uh, how do you think it was received by a giant crowd of hippies I mean the with, irony with of frowns this of violence <laughs> giant antifa riots now basically uh it was just kind of like an intimate setting of about 60 or 70 jason alice's fans and then the rest of the people over had uh, could not give a shit what i was saying wow. so uh, they didn't really care but um i did want to talk about that there because you know veganism is it's a cult and it's spreading everywhere and as with most cult members, you can't really reason with them. They're not the most reasonable people. And it doesn't matter how many facts you show or how many, how many pieces of evidence. They tend, to, um, they tend to want to have their cult beliefs. But uh, I know that when I can read globalists like Alvin Toffler, uh, who write about combining veganism and anarchism together, and he says that we can use this in the future— for clamping down on society and for social engineering, I know there's something to it. And Alvin Toffler is not a friend. He's a he's not a man of the people. He's not a populist. So who is that? Who uh, is Alan Toffler? In what context was he? He's did one he of the top this? globalists. He's more. He's like a uh, like a one of the the technocrat social planner type guys. He's like a Brzezinski, Brzezinski type guy, but not like as powerful as Brzezinski. Mm -hmm. He's like a lesser known kind of Brzezinski. So he wrote books like Future Shock and. Um, these books back in the seventies that talked about where they would take things towards the global technocracy. Mm -hmm. And what did he say? Um, what did he say? Do you have like, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but a s summary of the quote that he, uh, in which he mentioned like veganism as a religion. Um, if you look up, just, uh, just look, look up Alvin Toffler comma. Um, I think I put it in some articles on my website before, but, um, Alvin Toffler comma anarchism comma, uh, veganism. Uh, that's it's a pretty famous quote. Um, it should should come up pretty easy. I, in fact, I looked it up on, on Google the quote not too long ago. Nice. I've got a couple of his books here in my my bookshelf, but um, I don't remember the exact spot where he says that. But he does say that. I've I've double checked it multiple times. That's funny because we do um, see we see a big push kind of. We talked about this last time of, of veganism as <laughs> kind of this surrogate religion as an identity politics type thing for people. Actually. Uh, it's a pretty powerful quote. Can you, uh, you want to give me a second? I can yeah. Find it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm trying, I know I've got a little lag on the stream. Let me see. Let me, let me restart the stream real quick to see if I can get rid of this lag, guys. Start stream. Uh, so Jay's going to find the quote and I'm going to get rid of my lag. In 1975, Alvin Toffler wrote, we're not live, are we? We are back live now. There we go. Okay. Um, in 1975, Toffler wrote a, a, a bestseller called Eco Spasm, 
ecospasm. That's what the soy boys go into wow. uh, when they don't get their way. When they don't get their, so- <laughs> their way, W H U I, and their soy. Ha ha ha. Well, they can't uh, have way because that's an animal product, dude. I know. Uh, that didn't make sense. It, <laughs> but it's, it was almost but so close. <laughs> when they don't get their soy. Um, author of also Future Shock, Third Way, which I mentioned. Uh, he suggests a positive hope for the world's food crisis. Uh, he anticipates, quote, the sudden rise of a new religious movement in the West that will restrict the eating of meat and thereby save billions of tons of grain to be provided for the whole world. That sounds amazing. Like, why is that not? <laughs> People might be hearing this and vegans and stuff. They think this sounds awesome. And this is what's so funny to me. It's like to us, we hear total technocracy, total control, and to others, it's like, yeah, enlightenment, let's feed the poor brown people that I've never seen or met. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a strange phenomenon. Now, like, we talked a little bit, we talked about the changing images of man document. I think that's an important one for uh, people in the audience who want to research this stuff to check out, the Stanford Research Institute. Um, yeah. Because it, that one kind of ties it in with the New right. Age movement in certain ways. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So basically, the Esalen Institute is kind of the the brains behind the entire counterculture '60s, which then morphs into the New Age movement. And Esalen basically includes a whole host of big time New Age thinkers, all the way back to the Huxleys to Deepak Chopra, uh, Deepak Chopsticks, whatever that dude's name is. Deepak all- Chopra. I, actually, the first, <laughs> the second job I had, we had a, the Chopra Center was right next door so those people would come and i would i was a shuttle driver and a bellman so i'd be like i bring you back to your to your to your room sir and uh jump in a minivan and i would drive them to the chopra center they're always kind of nice people a little bit yoga a little bit exhale um, <laughs> well say, yeah i mean i don't know that i've ever met anybody from either of those groups although by the way in california there there were those centers there like uh basically every new california is a, a, a giant new age mecca basically is all it is anyway um esalen is, is located in big sur california too of course but they did tie in diet and control with new experimental ideology so if you look you could look at it like a giant test bed let's try all these different uh, alternative religious movements alternative ideologies let's see what catches on and that's basically what they've been doing is experimenting with these ideologies. And one of the key things to to control diet is – well, to control people is to control their diet. And one of the key ways to do that is to tie it to your religious movements, which is what, what Tolfer was just talking about. And you're absolutely right. Changing images of man speaks of that, which is all about changing man's view of himself. So we transition from uh, maybe older traditional ideas of the earth being here for man, transition that. And this is a key part of what Tavistock wanted to do, transition that to the idea that man is a cancer on Mother Earth, on Gaia. Mm. We're, we're a problem and we need to be uh, severely controlled, you know, keep the population down because we are like, I don't know, you know, like, like, like a flea, like, like, like fleas, like, yeah, on like dog. fleas on the skin of, of Mother Earth. Yeah. Isn't that funny? It's like you go from, you know, I mean, the, in the previous age, a majority of the people having believed that we're made in the image of God to having people believe that we're basically a, a, a ball of fucking putty in that. A virus, a, a cancer on earth, right? Yeah, yeah, right. But then also something that's just malleable, it's just to be formed oh, by yeah, our will. Plastic, plasticity. This is something H.G. Wells foreshadowed in uh, Island of Dr. Moreau. He, mm. he foreshadows the plasticity of man and the possibility of mutating man through uh, external technocratic means. So I think, all right, so the New Age movement, you mentioned Tavistock, too, and I think it's, it's interesting that Tavistock, how did Tavistock start out? I think that's kind yeah. of a nice segue because it, it ties into kind of the, the shock and awe of climate change. Yeah, it began right after World War I as a clinic for soldiers that came back that seemed to be all messed up. And this is where we get the idea of shell shock or PTSD down the road, right? They, these soldiers came back and they had all kinds of dissociative problems and emotional problems, couldn't remember things. Um, it became, eventually it was labeled shell shock, it became PTSD. Well, the idea was, why don't we devote a whole lot of money to actually studying the psyche and what results from wartime 
uh, what things we can get done actually for for social engineering in wartime. This is something that that's also was new to me uh, when I started looking into this, which was that you can actually get a lot more done in terms of mass engineering when you declare wartime. Right? For example, the UK pioneered rationing food uh, uh, during wartime, and this was and right so, around the time, wasn't that? Right when like wells huxley and like that's kind of the Absolutely. the end of the industrial revolution kind of the them seeing like the the decay of industrial revolution and then it seems like there was this thread of thought of just seeing man as the humo- homunculus almost you know just something to be made that's a great point yeah I, I mean it can range from seeing man as something that needs to be perfected some kind of an older alchemical view that that nature is defective and it's the job of the scientific priest class to perfect man or to alter him into transhumanism or something like this. Or it can range all the way over into something like uh, a more overtly satanic view that man is an abortion, that man is, an, is was not intended to actually be here. You know, we need to be replaced by the bots or something like that. And there actually are, you know, different strands of uh, technocratic madness, scientific, uh, you know, madmen mad scientists who, who, who go that far. But, um, I did want to make the point that, that it's crucial to see that, that the, the role of Tavistock wasn't that, that important until they received a giant Rockefeller grant. They received a whole bunch of money from the Rockefeller foundation, which shows again, that it doesn't matter that this is in the UK. It's the same Atlantis's power structure, the U S UK, Israel, that's who has for a long time controlled the West. Uh, and behind that is a sort of a giant banking power structure. So the Rockefellers put a whole bunch of money into this institute, and it became no longer Tavistock Clinic, but the Tavistock Institute, uh, which then became the premier social engineering organization in the world. Uh, so, <clears throat> so they began to do everything from uh, corporate management studies, structures, styles, to um, – studies for uh, special operations teams, how to get groupthink going, uh, anything you could think of relating to structures of management and control is, is what Tavistock really pioneered and, and went crazy with. And they were connected to, as you said, Stanford Research, they were connected to MK Ultra uh, mind control operations and studies. Um, they were kind of the the UK analog of the US version of MK Ultra. So what was going on at, in the US at different universities, Harvard and so forth, dozens of universities actually participated in MK Ultra. Um, other uh, universities in Canada, Brzezinski went to McGill University, which is one of the key uh, MK Ultra universities. Um, and then and its analog in the UK was was Tavistock. So it's essentially the same giant structure studying and doing different things, testing things on the British public, testing things on the U.S. public. And again, a big part of that was new ideologies and new ways to view man and his diet. They pioneered diet studies. One of these guys was uh, Lewin and – well, actually two of them, Lewin and Rees. And Lewin and Rees were the first guys to say uh, – it was actually Kurt Lewin, uh, famous psychologist, psychoanalyst type guy, who said, I'm going to – do a giant test on on seeing if I can transition a bunch of meat eaters to a grain only based diet, and he was very successful at it. That was back in the seventies. What was he looking at? I mean, what else was he was he measuring when he did this test? Was he doing cognitive ability tests or like you know social science? I mean, what, what who was this guy, and what was he actually studying in this? Uh, I'm trying to remember. Kurt Lewin was a wartime. Uh, psychoanalyst psychologist who had some affiliation with the government and he was the premier uh tavistock uh psychologist he was he was the top guy at tavistock if i recall uh, yeah. during the 60s and 70s i want to say there was another guy who did it with him uh rees r-e-e-s so i'm going totally from memory here but um the only the, what i mainly remember with lewin was that he uh his first successful groupthink test, and it did relate directly to, to groupthink, um, was to just pick out a group of people uh, who, who had a, a heavily meat-based diet to see if he could convince them uh, just to eat grains. So I don't recall beyond that what, what the details are, but that was kind of what he made his name 
doing. And then he had a lot more prominence. So you can look him up. I mean, he's he's pretty well known guy. You can look him up. Kurt he, Lewin, L E W I N. Yeah. yeah, just I I pulled up. I I don't want to go down too far in the rabbit hole because I fe- what I found was there's an interesting article here about uh, World War II. It's a study concerning changing. Uh, changing eating habits on the home front, lost lessons from World yeah. War II research. So he talks about getting people to actually eat. You know, in the U.S., it was con- it was perceived as not good to eat like liver and kidney and brains, mm-hmm. and people started eating this during World War II because there were more affordable cuts of meat. What's funny is we talk about here on the channel about how these are actually they're affordable cuts of meat, but they're also really nutrient dense. But it was considered a taboo before this but then during these years it was very easy to convince people to eat different types of food and it says the author discusses the behaviorally driven implications from these lost lessons in the context of the empirical contributions they made in defining what makes an unfavorable food acceptable so making one making something that was one time completely unfavorable you know like uh i don't know maybe cannibalism which you're seeing normalized now making that favorable so it seems like maybe they were uh, who knows? I mean, w- when you look into um, MK Ultra, I think what's really interesting. A lot of people just think, uh, like, oh, they they gave some hookers some drugs um, in San Francisco, like the History Channel version of MK Ultra. When really there are a lot of uh, declassified papers and stuff, and a lot of the guys who were first interested in MK Ultra were very interested in uh, what was called at the time cybernetics. Um, have you have you looked at this angle much? Like the the connection between computer yeah. networks, uh, behaviorism, computer networks, and MK Ultra. Mm-hmm. Um, this is this is and I know this is a weird loop to put this in, and for a lot of people, you might you, you might think that this is a strange angle to take. But um, yeah, I think we can bring this full circle eventually and connect this with the nature of the internet, social engineering via YouTube, via Google, yeah. via just the constant barrage of um, feedback loops that were given through the computer. Have you have you looked into some of that research? Because that's something I've been thinking of diving into lately. But it seems like uh, you know, first of all, I don't have access to a lot of the journals anymore because I'm not at a university, so I can't get on like JSTOR or mm-hmm. uh, uh, LexisNexis and look at like humanities stuff. Um, no, this is a, a very uh, well known um, documented connection. You're right on. Uh, Richard Grove has a, a lot of work on in this area where he's talked about the connection between. MK Ultra and and cybernetics, and the idea of, of uh, cybernetics goes back to Plato too. The Greeks talked about it, the idea that you could basically create programmed people. The Greeks didn't know about programs, but they roughly had an idea of kybernetikos in the Greek. But um, if you if you there's a guy named Norbert Weinert uh, and quite a few of the MK Ultra doctors. Um, and if, there's also a really good documentary about MKUltra and the internet and the Unabomber, um, which was made by a German guy or a Dutch guy in 2003 or four. Yes, that's I saw really, that. It's called The Net or something, right? Or The Web. A, yeah. That thing, that that documentary is actually really, really good. Yeah, he that shows the connections between the people at SLN, a lot of the Big Sur, New Age people who were basically tripping acid and coming up with the idea of the new using the neosphere, which is a term used by certain uh, philosophers for the idea of a mental sphere where you could transfer information. This was kind of a pioneering idea for the internet. Mm -hmm. And um, those guys were, many of them actually pioneers in cybernetics too. So there there is absolutely a connection. And and another way to look at that connection is many of the MKUltra doctors, like Dr. Jose Delgado, they actually pioneered putting electronic, modification implements rfid this kind of stuff into animals and humans they they pioneered this they were doing this decades and decades ago back and in the he 40s. actually yeah he said he had full control he, he did a demonstration i mean i could pull up a video i don't feel like searching right now but there's a video of jose delgado stopping a bull yeah. dead in its tracks with a remote yeah. control a yeah. bull that was charging at him yeah john c Lilly was screwing with the dolphins um literally dr jolian west was giving lsd to elephants so they were doing all this stuff experimenting with alternative states of consciousness and actually there's a stupid ass movie that's that's entertaining because it's so goofy have you seen altered states yeah (laughs) 
I used that's to a, I used to be super into psychedelics and stuff. Or, oh, okay. Well, so. altered states is supposed to be John C. Lilly. Yeah. <laughs> that's who that makes. Well, is. and now you've got I mean some of the major countercultural so called countercultural figures of today, guys um, like I mean Joe Rogan. He's kind of uh, the modern pioneer of a. What's funny is uh, nothing against Joe. Like I, you know, he's probably a great guy, probably very nice person, but for the most part, he's kind of <laughs> his ideology and uh, his whole shtick is basically an extension of a lot of these things and i think that's really funny i don't think he understands the full you know historical scope of like you know john c Lilly's invention of the isolation tank um mm -hmm. the propagation of uh psilocybin by time magazine and that what was that the banker's name who went wasson uh gordon wasson worked for jp morgan yeah and then yeah henry loose time magazine they promoted all that right <clears throat> mm -hmm. and and now we see this is a major part of kind of what we see as the modern the alchemy of the soy boy i guess we could call it for this one is uh you know psychedelics yeah, I, the, <clears throat> the more that i that i i get older the more i i go on the more i see how powerful the 60s countercultural revolution really was and <clears throat> and the more that i'm convinced that it was actually largely either co-opted or or done by the establishment itself mm -hmm. fostered for the purpose of creating and, and when we look at Eslan Institute, when we look at documents like Changing Images of Man, when we look at these things, it really does back up the fact that the, the counterculture so-called revolution was so useful to the establishment and to the technocrats for creating the, the, the not just the soy boy. This, I view the soy boy as basically the late, you know, third, fourth generation iteration of the 60s revolution mm. right so you, the boomers underwent phase one this is partly why the boomers are so silly uh was they were indoctrinated with that 60s garbage um then you had the next phase which was you know i guess maybe a reaction against the the, the yuppies and people in the 80s that were you know i don't know snorting coke trying to be michael j fox bud fox mm -hmm. in wall street mm -hmm. <laughs> they're going to be reagan or something and then then it goes to you know like 90s and we've got like um grunge we've got punk well punk wasn't 90s but but th all of these these trends they're all uh iterations of the 60s countercultural revolution yeah and, and the modern soy boy you could look at it as kind of this amalgamation of like a piecemeal thing almost like a uh, yeah. like a freaking collage of yeah these countercultural things it's like to me he's like, like the final he's like the final version of where they wanted to take hmm. the revolution the whole time and that's what huxley said huxley said back in 1932 that all the revolutions culminate in the technocracy they don't culminate in your freedom and you've been able to run naked in the woods it culminates in you you being a freaking soy boy lab experiment with cancer and you know <laughs> your, your testes haven't dropped you know what i mean uh yeah, so yeah. Um, I think that the, the creation of the soy boy and I'll, I'm also considering recently based on some of my friends arguments and some of the points that uh, Estelin makes in his book on Tavistock, the creation of, an, of, of the autistic so soy boy, which mm. the autistic savant soy boy type guy is perfect for <laughs> becoming a coder, becoming a psychopathic yeah. cubicle worker. Uh, and I think that this, the establishment actually wanted that. They wanted that kind of a creature. There's actually documents. You can find documents uh, from uh, scientific research from the CIA talking about altering people's RNA and DNA. I put this in my first book um, back in the 60s. So even back then they were talking about how they could, they could actually alter uh, testosterone levels, alter – uh, through diet, through injections and injunctions. Yeah, I mean, even uh, what's his name, Bertrand Russell, had talked about that too about altering hormones. Um, I th didn't. Was it Lord Birkenhead or was it H. Uh, G. Wells that also wrote about the same thing? Probably both of them. Probably both of them. Um, the the what I always go back to is this. Um, it's a guy who's who quotes Kessler because Kessler ends his book Ghost in the Machine talking about alchemy. And how the the population would be subjected to this dark alchemy and turned into these uh, NPC soy boy you know goblin creatures, uh, jellyfish creatures. Uh, what is that guy's name? Doctor. Um, he wrote. He's got two. Holger. Doctor Holger Hyden. Mm -hmm. He's got two papers that were. Pre 
that were present. One of them was presented at the 1968 Mind Control Conference. Hello, in California, in San Francisco, put on by the CIA. Didn't Huxley uh, go? Was Huxley there too? He may have been. Yes, he was. He was. That's right. Now, just, was. I'm sorry to, to derail this, but have you seen? All right, I've heard it claimed a lot that like it's on paper in it's actually documented that Huxley was one of the curators of MK Ultra originally on behalf of MI6. Is that true or is that – I haven't seen that document. I'd say it's very likely because – and I even think now that probably Crowley was an early, early version of it because his drug diaries was – that was going on while he was MI6 asset. Yeah, he was blackmailing people and he was involved in you know child uh, abuse. And he and was stuff. giving drugs to people – he was oh he would dose be, people on mescaline unbeknownst so he was like the yes, original before, tim leary or yeah before huxley was doing it. oh and so. then and then tim leary you've heard when tim leary made the statement that he believed he was continuing the work of crowley and he was channeling right. crowley yeah so i think crowley was kind of an early version of this it, it begins in the world of espionage where he's writing his drug diaries and testing them on himself and giving it to other people people in mi6 are like hey hmm where could we go with this uh, later on down the road, uh, Huxley, you know, he pioneers this. He does a bunch of LSD himself. He writes all his books, promotes it, pretends like he's a good guy, which um, uh, many of the British elite do this. They pretend that they're, you know, Democrats and men of the people when, in fact, they're they're just the uh, left side of the elite uh, Royal Society, uh, Cliveden set, um, which is basically the Rothschild faction. Um so, no, I don't think it's all at all a stretch to think that Huxley was absolutely pioneering and at the top of this. In fact, uh, as I put in Esoteric Hollywood 2, it was Huxley and a bunch of the Hollywood crew that were beginning to popularize LSD in the 40s and 50s, way didn't, before. Didn't Huxley live in Laurel Canyon at one time? Mm -hmm. I, just, I just learned that well, he was. He was... Um, Cary Grant was was tripping way before any yeah. of the Grateful Dead were tripping, and that guy was a nutcase too. Like he was like he was super wild, fucking man. crazy. I remember reading about oh Cary Grant was tripping this when I was like a teenager. Oh, it's cool, you know, it, it's safe, it's good, the acid's great. Um, and I read about Cary Grant, and it was like oh you know he, was, he he really helped to cure his depression, his bipolar with this. But then you read about the guy, he was like apparently just a total fucking monster in real life. He was crazy, yeah. He was a wild man, and. Uh, Quite a few, actually, of the, the Hollywood crew at that. And I think even JFK was uh, tripping before any of the hippies were. Interesting. Um, because it was Sandoz who, who manufactured these drugs. It was Sandoz right. Who and, and, if, and they first synthesized psilocybin um, at Sandoz. Yes. And if you read Wim Hof's book, which I highly recommend, he shows how <clears throat> it was actually uh, C.D. Jackson and, and Henry Luce they weren't just promoting that stuff on Time Magazine. Like, they had already, in the circles of the elite, they had all been tripping. Yeah, so, it'd be so interesting to see. I would love to see, some, you know, some of the the dark white papers that were around back in the day. You know, the stuff that was, you know, not published in, uh, in these studies. Because it, it is a fascinating aspect. And anybody who's engaged in these so-called psychedelics or uh, people call them infusions. You know, let's look at another one of these propaganda terms for it. Um, you know, I'm not. I'm not saying that they're all bad or that everything about it is terrible, but it's like it is very, very obvious that you know this is a cultural programming tool, and it's been used for thousands of years as such as initiation into the mysteries, right? I mean, this is like Huxley, and then they talked about they they really uh, kind of romanticized the Eleusian mysteries, or how do you say it, Eleusian mysteries of uh, uh, Eleusinian, yeah, right. I don't know who knows how you say it, but when. You know, they, these are these are tools that have been used for thousands of years. In the Maya, they would use them. Uh, they would actually trip out on their, their priests would be tripping right. balls on these drugs and uh, sacrificing human beings and eating their organs at the top of pyramids uh, on on you know request of the gods, of course, because the uh, you know the crops weren't growing, the weather was changing, all these scary things were happening in the sky that people couldn't understand and. You know, what do you think? Do you like that film Apocalypto? It's one of my favorite movies. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's funny you said that because uh, we were just talking about Apocalypto the other day. Well, when I was at that hippie rally, <laughs> when I was doing my talk, I was just looking around around thinking. By the way, uh, there was no other tent or, or booth 
there was hundreds, probably a hundred booths at this place. No other booth had any books. What does that tell you? Uh, what are they selling? Nobody necklaces? at this thing reads. No books. We don't do books. What did they sell? I was sell? the only only bookseller there. What are all the hippies selling? Crystals and drugs? Crystals, drugs, um, clothes. It's like a big fashion show. Oh, Bunch yeah. Because like... it's super important that you look the part when you're getting spiritual, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the, it, and, and I was in Topanga Canyon, and it has its own style. Like the, the style of the canyon is different from, you know, L.A. style or whatever. So if you live in the canyon, you know, presumably you're basically a rich hippie. <laughs> so this is like the millionaire yeah. hippie. For sure, no. You you and you like you like have like an old truck, but it's like a 1977 Ford F100 that's like perfectly built with a new Coyote engine in it. And it's like you know you've got you've got like a nice house and you call it a barn. And you my call dad it- bought me. My dad bought me. Yeah. <laughs> I live I live in a five story tent out back that my dad built. Yeah. Uh, it's like like my dad refuses to let me use his boat this weekend. He's such a fucking asshole. He hates me. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. No, that that area is funny. I I have a, had a buddy who he was like in a, he had a normal family and he lived in Malibu Canyon, not not like Topanga Canyon or anything, but he lived That's... near Will Smith and and all yeah. that. He had a normal family. They had horses and stuff, but they had had their land for a long time. Uh, but it was funny just how he talked about how the neighborhood was. He was just like, dude, it's so fucking weird. Like, all these people are, are so loaded. Will Smith's house right there. Mel Gibson lives up there. It's just like strange, strange place. Yeah. No, yeah. We, we were over. Uh, this is da- David Lynch is, is near there. Um, Laura Palmer from Twin Peaks. Yep. Cheryl Lee is there. Um, they weren't at the event, but I'm saying that this, yeah. they live over there, too. But, uh, but yeah, that's... Um, where were we going with it? Well, we were talking about drug culture, hippie culture. Uh, oh, you're, oh, you're the I was only just saying, book. Yeah, how room. easily manipulated a lot of these people are because they, th- I mean, there's nothing counterculture about any of this. They're, they're all going along with the same fashions, the same styles. They all dress the same. Nothing unique about it. Um, and then when you look, as you said, into the the forefathers of counterculture, especially Tim Leary. Uh, I mean, tune in, turn down, drop out, you know, basically be a deadhead, be a mindless idiot. Come on. This is this is ridiculous. How could you not see that that's social engineering? Do you think they actually gamed these things like using cybernetics and using networks in behaviorist studies? Because if you took a group of 200 people back then and you were to start administering LSD and creating feedback loops using simple computer networks and stuff and like approval, disapproval, like now you have like, dislike, smiley face emoji, that I wonder if they didn't start – Doing biofeedback and actually mm. measuring people's, e, uh, you know, doing EEGs and stuff while doing these feedback games back then. Like if the if the internet, if a, the start of the internet and social media had its roots in some of these behaviorist studies done in the 60s, 50s under MK right. Ultra, it, it, to me it just seems like it's the natural extension of it. I would not be surprised. I bet you're probably spot on there. And in, and in fact, uh, let's not forget that the behaviorism as a school also got its money and its funding from Rockefeller Watson, especially J uh, BF Skinner. BF Skinner was absolutely a Rockefeller man. They put everything behind him. They really believed in his pragmatic operant conditioning behaviorist type approach. Um, and what you're talking about with this idea of the feedback loop, it makes perfect sense with, with Skinnerian thought because Mm -hmm. you're basically just a receptacle. And then you're only going to put out what's put into you. There's not any soul. There's no mind. There's no creative yeah. free will uh, agent there. It's just a repeat mechanism. So that is absolutely what social engineering or uh, uh, social media is for, is to, cre- is to create the feedback, the, the, to program the people, basically. So mm-hmm. I mean, it makes perfect sense. I would not be surprised if – so basically social media, you could say, is just – Skinnerian operant conditioning right Absolutely. and then and if and you have the centralized hub where it's like you have the panopticon built into it too is like right. holographically because you have google youtube they don't tell you what is accepted you just know that, that if you say certain <laughs> things like oh that's right. fake or that event didn't happen then you're going to get fucking kicked off into platforms you're going to yep. you lose your personhood so i think i really think we could be seeing exactly that and the creation of the soy boy 
could be going on right under our noses right here in the lovely YouTube community? Well, um, don't forget, too, that if somebody wants hard evidence, um, if you, I, I looked this up about three years ago. I'm, I'm assuming it's still there. It may not be. I don't know. Maybe scrub. But if you look up Dr. Holger Hyden, H-Y-D-E-N, um, his papers on manipulating RNA and DNA and actually flipping genders, like not literally, but like making males more feminine and, and females more masculine. He has scientific journal papers on doing this from the 60s. Uh, so, I mean, what does that tell you? And he's presenting them at the CIA mind control conference. I mean, come on. This is like, it's a no-brainer. See, and it was funny is because there's a few people in the chat here talking about how much they like psychedelics. Uh, you can tell who's done them after doing them. Haha, <laughs> Jim Carrey, the iPhone is running off psychedelics and the Beatles, our ancestors. I don't know what that guy's talking about. He sounds like he's a little bit high on that heavy juice right now. Um, <laughs> but someone says, okay, well, Skinner, having been Rockefeller funded, psych major here. My mind is being blown. Psych major, man. You ever take psych courses in undergrad? How disheartening is that to realize that everybody teaching psychology doesn't know a fucking thing about humanity at all? <laughs> you look into it's their like eyes. It's like economics classes at college too, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Broke ass professors, purple yeah, hair like, shit. Broke ass professors are gonna tell you like compared to you know like a billionaire. They're like you has zero because the patriarchy. Um, yeah. Right. <laughs> so yeah, so I think that's interesting. Skinner didn't he keep his daughter in a box or in a cage? There's a story that, 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 that he, yeah, that he did that. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, these, a lot of, again, Alfred Kinsey, Pedo, Rockefeller funded, follows Crowley. Was there a connection Crow to uh, uh, Man, uh, Marilyn Monroe and Skinner? Who was, who was Marilyn Monroe's psychiatrist? Do you know? I know this is kind of trivial, trivia stuff, but I, recently I was hearing a little bit about the connection between Marilyn Monroe and she had a psychiatrist who was yes. highly connected to a lot of these networks. I forget who it was, but no, it, it, yeah, it's one of the big uh, these major guys. It's one of the big name guys. He was a behaviorist, and then he was working with Jimmy Watson, maybe, maybe, and then she killed herself kind of under her his watch. And this was kind okay. of in the heyday of that uh, MK Ultra stuff. But okay, anyway, so we we got people talking about all these uh, research chemical now. Someone's like, two CE is great. You know, the, all these research chemicals, man, these things are crazy. I can't believe people are taking these. Um, uh, please, people, don't take these damn research chemicals. 2C2T754C3PO. is not – you don't know what you're taking, guys. Um, okay, so <laughs> back to the task at hand, the alchemy of the soy boy. So – Tim Leary, I think that's an interesting connection. We're going all over the place here, but we're weaving a nice little tapestry. So Tim Leary, the connections to Tavistock, um, the obvious MK Ultra connections, uh, him being Harvard professor at the height of the movement, being promoted by Time Life. Tim Leary was like the early, he was like the first internet guy. I don't know if anybody, like have you ever read some of his early, his work is almost unreadable, it's ridiculous, but um, he was pioneering this idea of the internet in like the 80s. Well, that's because he was hanging out with these people into cybernetics and the people from from Esalen who had been talking about the possibility of tapping into the neosphere. So I would I wouldn't uh, credit Tim Tim Leary as some genius figuring this out. He was just in the circles of people in uh, you know DARPA level type stuff who who had been batting these these ideas around. Plus, uh, the internet uh, it already existed in the '60s, so he probably heard about this you know, already existing that the military was already sending information packets through ARPANET back in the sixties. So, uh, and it was actually at the, the original ARPANET connected Stanford research, MIT, um, some California, or, well, the Stanford's out there and it connected MIT and then a couple other universities. So he was probably at, it may, might've even been Harvard too. Mm -hmm. So he was probably at a university where they, they had the internet back then. That's just so wild. And to, to, to see like the fruits of that and then to see now with the internet and we're seeing another push. I don't know if you notice this too, but there's another big push for like um, normalizing so-called psychedelics. Uh, mm -hmm. You've got maps, which is run by this guy. Uh, have you looked into maps? Like the, the, uh, the guy that runs maps, 
Dob- Somebody Doblin. brought this up to me the other day, but no, it's new to me. Rick Doblin. I mean, there's some old interviews with him where he's talking about how he, the CIA tried to recruit him back in the day, but he was like, no, I'm not going to join you. I'm going to go work at the FDA. He worked at the FDA, and I believe he testified before Congress uh, to have MDMA made illegal. And he kind of, I believe he actually was pushing for MDMA to be made illegal back in the day and then switched his tune and now is advocating for legal MDMA, but administered by psychiatrists. Um, So, I mean, and we're seeing like a big move, even in, you know, the health world, you see a lot of people promoting Burning Man, um, Mm -hmm. psychedelics. There's like this thing of like psychedelics, polyamory, and, and, you know, the, the, a lot of these things are kind of coalescing into this, uh, this alchemical creation of the, the so-called soy boy. So last time we talked a lot about diet, um, and it seems like this time we're talking a little bit more about the other cultural phenomenon, making the modern man or boy or demanding the modern <laughs> um, uh, man. But I mean, are there any other aspects of this that, that you think are relevant to looking at? I mean, you've got, you've got drugs. Internet. Well, there is also the the occult or esoteric side of it that we can talk about too, which ties in the drugs, it ties in the diet, it ties in the social engineering, and and the new age really uh, comes out of the lodge Freemasonry, and it comes out of Crowleyism. Uh, you know, Crowley was the first to really promote the idea that that we're going to go into a new aeon. Um, Crowley is the father of the hippie movement. He's the father of the gay rights movement. He's the father of NAMBLA. How um, is he the father age. of the hippie movement? Because the, the hippie movement in its combination of drugs and, and, and the people who promoted it were self-consciously drawing on and promoting Crowley, mm-hmm. especially somebody like Tim Leary. Um, most of the rock stars who, who really promoted um, the 60s counterculture, the Beatles, uh, Rolling Stones, they were self-consciously, at least to varying degrees, Crowleyans. Um, many people in the establishment who promoted uh, the counterculture were to varying degrees Crowleyans. And then, I mean, Crowley's influence goes all the way into pop culture, rap music, heavy metal. I mean, Crowley's everywhere in metal. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I'm not saying that that Crowley said, let's uh, start the hippie movement and then 10 years, 20, 30 years later. No, I'm saying that it's kind of a combination of ideology and ideas. Like the first mention of the new age is like the Masonic Scottish Rite Journal. Mm. Um, Helena Blavatsky, the famous occultic theosophist con woman, talks about the coming of the new age. Um, so she was people, wasn't she really connected with a lot of the British aristocracy as well as she German. was probably British intelligence. A yeah. lot. So was Crowley. Uh, and Hitler so really acts, drew for, Hitler drew a lot from Blavatsky in the Secret Doctrine. Um, yeah, right. for the mythology of of uh, the Reich and all that. Exactly. Um, Alfred Rosenberg concocted a lot of that stuff from Theosophy. Um, so what I'm saying is that the Crowleyan spirit kind of undergirds this, the counterculture movement. And one of the ironies of it is that the Crowleyan spirit is not just drugs and, and, and free love and all this stuff. He was very much an elitist. He was very much a, a member of you know British elite society, or he viewed himself as one of the elite. And so he actually believed that the masses should be crushed under a giant, you know, sort of empire the slave shall serve he says you, if you're a slave you deserve it you yeah. you, you get what you deserve so well, what i'm an saying interesting is that, character too because he seemed like he actually go, i'm sorry go ahead well i'm just gonna say in the background of this new aeon this new age is a figure who is completely laughing at the idea that's for the masses that's the outer portico lie that you're told that you're part of this new age uh, whereas in the background it's really run by the secret chiefs, the secret elite, um, intelligence agents, technocrats, you know, billionaires, trillionaires. You know, it's funny. I thought you were going to actually say another thing that Crowley is not really given credit for is uh, I thought you were going to say yoga because. Oh, that's he is. You're right. Right. I mean, that's to me, that's one of the he was one of the major Good point, one of the major proponents of yoga. Yeah, but he was bringing that to the West before Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and the Beatles were. Yeah, um, and he paved the way for that. Right. And he's um, also got connections to the Beatles as well. He's on the front of the Beatles albums. Right. Uh, and seems to have possibly been an influence on uh, lovely men like, uh, what's his face? The, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the guy that liked to... 
you go to the, he, he worked at all the hospitals, the philanthropist, the British. Oh, Savile? Savile. Yeah, there seemed to be some possible connections, especially ideologically and ceremonially to, yeah. to Savile in the way that that guy went about it. Right. I wouldn't be surprised. Absolutely. Yeah, he, he's attracted a, a wide dearth of, of weird people, but, and powerful people. So, mm. you know, it's, it's a, it's an ideology that can be, uh, used in different ways anyway. But, um, I gotta use the bathroom really quick. We take a, take a break for a second. Yeah. You can bring the camera in there yeah, if you want. Go you, piss really quick. Okay. You, you can, you could show us if you want show the audience. You're talking about no, your huge dog earlier. I don't want to scare the women in the audience with, oh, okay. with, with that kind of stuff. <laughs> All right, no, I'll, I'll pull the, the YouTube. Uh, actually, we'll just. <laughs> I'll be right back. Yeah, man. All right, guys. So let's jump over here to the chat. See what people are talking about here. Shamanism is invention of Western anthropologists, says Anthony. Uh, well, it's not an invention of Western anthropologists. The word shamanism is um, is, is a Western term. Here, here actually in in South America, there's no. They don't consider themselves shamans. These guys, they, they consider themselves sorcerers. Quite literally, they consider themselves sorcerers. They call each other brujos. They call each other witches. And they're involved in spiritual battle here in the jungles. It's not about enlightening people with ayahuasca. It's about power. Um, so we've got a lot, quite a few people talking about uh, how awesome they think psychedelics are. It's like, look, if you think these things are great, all good. But, you know, the, the guy who actually brought ayahuasca to the modern con and look, I used to be all for it. I used to think if I could just sprinkle a little LSD on everybody in the world, we could figure all of it out. Right. But this is the like, this is kind of the spiritual deception that I would say that these things bring about. They make you think that you're enlightened. They make you think, they make you feel comfortable. They make you happy. They give you feelings. They give you an experience. Right? They give you the spiritual experience. They don't give you a spiritual life. And a lot of people end up just taking that and just building this whole false reality around it. Like, oh, I wear pretty colors now. I wear Shipibo gear. Um, my shaman told me that every time I have a negative thought, if I just close my eyes and envision his beautiful face, and I can watch Don Carlos or Don Jim sprinkle his perfume on me in ceremony. <laughs> right? It's like when you actually when you look at the ceremonies now, like the actual ceremonies that go on, most of them are administered by Westerners who have been here for three to five months. Or, I'm sorry, or three to five years. <laughs> who have been in South America for a few years. They met a couple dudes in the jungle who were down to take a bunch of their money or all of their money. And they study under these so-called shamans. They call them curanderos. They study under the curanderos. <clears throat> and then they start giving other people drugs. Um, but when you look at the actual culture around the so-called shamanism here, in the jungles, it's all spiritual warfare. And that's what these Westerners who are coming here and getting their doses of ayahuasca don't understand, is that the people that are giving it to them don't care about anything other than power. Okay? <laughs> Carnival says, as people in Ecuador talk about brujos using San Pedro. So Carnival also lives in Ecuador, and uh, he's over in the chat, and he understands exactly what I'm talking about. You Westerners coming down here to South America thinking you're going to get enlightenment, you're coming down here and you're getting fucking spiritually molested. <laughs> That's all you're doing. You're coming down here and these freaking Westerners who have maybe been down here for half a generation, if you're lucky, you know, like uh, some of these guys being popularized down in Peru, they might have been here for 20 or 30 years, but these are just fried out old hippies who like to dose up and they come down here and they want to dose you up and they want to feel up some chicks and they want to feel powerful and they, you know, they'll... They'll let you snort some, uh, some DMT out of a human bone that they tell you is an old <laughs> shaman's bone. It's like the shit, they, these people have skulls and shit on their little mesas that you come up and bow to. Why do you think there's a ceremonial aspect to it that's so legalistic, people? <laughs> you're not dealing with real spirituality. You're dealing with spiritual experiences. And there's a lot of shit that goes on behind the scenes with these folks that are administering their drugs to you. And if you knew what they really think about you, you wouldn't be fucking sitting down drinking ayahuasca with, you know, white man Don Howard with his fucking feather hat um, and, his, uh, and his bottle of booze that he's drinking while he gives you ayahuasca and doesn't even drink it himself. That's what a lot boomer of these guys gurus. do. <laughs> boomer gurus. Guru boomers, right? 
Exactly, man. And it's it's sad. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of people getting real, real, really fleeced by this stuff. But um, yeah, is is there a con man element too, where they're like, you know, by the way, you know, this is a thirty dollar, you know, experience, absolutely. fifty dollar experience. Well, I mean, we're talking fifteen hundred dollar uh, retreats oh. for a week long ayahuasca experience, where these guys oh, okay. are fifteen hundred dollars. <laughs> Uh, sometimes it's a seven day and all they feed people is rice and plantain. So they literally, they make you sleep in a tent. A lot of the times you bring your own tent and you get to hang out with these beautiful shamans though. And what you do is you pay $1,500. They give you drugs like five or seven times that cost them nothing to make because it's just some plants and they feed you nothing but rice and plantains to get you nice and open to the experience. So you don't get any fats, no no oils, no uh, animal foods, a little bit of lean chicken sometimes in the dieta. The diet's a part of it because it's about priming your vessel for the reception of what they would consider spiritual so, energy. So you're seeing firsthand this kind of a thing in this microcosm of these these uh, boomer gurus. And I'm saying that you know what I've said for a long time was it looks to me like what – Social engineers, the technocrats, the CIA, what they did was when they sent their men, Gordon Wasson and others, down to Central Latin America, I think Carlos Castaneda was another one of these characters, mm -hmm. they were studying how the religions worked to basically control the, the population there. Absolutely. And then they brought that back, and then and you want to say, well, how does that apply to modern America? The, the big pharma is who exported that to the entire country. So the entire country is under a large scale shamanic curse <laughs> from like the big pharma and the CIA and the establishment. That's what I view it as. What that's very, very interesting. I think that's a really interesting theory. And if you were to write an essay on that, you could I'm sure that you could flesh that out really well. Because actually, yeah, when you look at when you all right, so say you look at the results of if you give ten million doses of of LSD to a certain population that's been programmed in a certain way by certain media to receive the message in a specific way and to open up their senses to tune on, turn in, drop out. Uh, I mean, you even had somebody mentioned earlier, and then I re-mentioned it. William Burroughs was the guy who first brought ayahuasca into popularity through his book. I think he wrote about it in, um, it wasn't Howell, another one of his disgusting uh, pieces of literature that uh, NAMBLA member William Burroughs um, he, he brought this to popularity. But anyways, this is not supposed to be about just me. I'm not bashing drugs. I'm not here to bash. But I'm, I'm telling you my perspective on these things. And I think that um, I think Jay's definitely onto something there. When you look at like the cultural waves that got created by it, maybe, it, maybe it's predictable. Maybe if you take 100 people and you do behaviorist studies with LSD, there will be a certain algorithmically predictable behavior of many of them. And that could be extrapolated into society and then change society through that. Yeah, I think you're onto something. I mean, I haven't delved super deep into cybernetics, so I'm not I'm not really anything approaching expert on that. But um, I know that both of the 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 books that were written about MK Ultra in the '70s, kind of the two pioneer books on it, the Walter Bowert Operation Mind Control book and the John Marks uh, CIA and the Search for Mentoring Candidate book, they both kind of go into the fact that what's what mk ultra moved into was uh electromagnetic tech mm. uh, implantable chips implantable rfid um cybernetics that that is a big part of it the brain human computer interface stuff that's all part of it uh the salk institute and what you start to realize is that most of these programs uh, whether it be, say, over here you've got geoengineering and altering the biosphere, you might think, oh, that's something over there. And then you've got over here Manhattan Project, and then you've got over here MKUltra. Actually, a lot of these these programs are not disconnected. It's a lot of the same people looking at different ones, working in different ones. Some of these are under the same agency, like Atomic Energy Commission. Uh, eventually, all of the, the geoengineering stuff, which is connected to Manhattan Project, it's all under the, the AEC, Atomic Energy Commission, which now is like it's under Department of Defense or something like that. But point being is that these are not all disconnected. The, the, the system is very much a system. It's very much looking at the interconnections between all these things. Now, you people us down here at the bottom of the pyramid, pyramid we're not supposed to know that or see that. We're supposed to think that uh, things just randomly happen in the world. Yeah. It's all just chaos and, and happen, you know. 
Reactionary but movements, natural reactionary movements. Natural reactionary movements. People are mad and angry at the system, and Grr. they don't see that. A great example of this, uh, the, the depth that this stuff can go is, uh, if you read F. William Engdahl's book, uh, Full Spectrum Dominance, he talks about the fact that um, in the 60s, they were, the Rand Corporation was studying the student riots, mm. and they were studying the student riots to see uh, how mobs formed how they acted in a in a formation and how they dissipated. Mm -hmm. Now, the, do you think any of those '60s students that were that were rioting at Kent State or wherever, do you think they knew that? No, I didn't know what they were. They had no idea they were participating in a large social engineering experiment for the rank corporate. They just thought they were fighting the man, man. Mm -hmm. But no, they still do. Dude, I talked there's to boomers. Little, there's little mad scientists over in the corner, like watching you. And, uh, you know exactly. I, I, so a lot of these boomers I know, man, they still think that they still brag about it. Like, yeah, the drugs were so good. We were getting laid. <laughs> what the fuck? You really Fine. think they're just still talking about how amazing the drugs and sex were in the 1960s. It's sad. I got this picture pulled up from a CNN style article. It's called Designing Bodies of the Future. And it shows yeah, like you saw that one. Yeah. It's just really disgusting. I mean, it's just some of these and images. That's, that's so where the, yeah. so, so you can see that the, the transhumanist. Uh, movement towards the body mods and towards, uh, you know, interchangeable limbs and all this kind of stuff, which sounds good. I'm not saying it's wrong to prosthetics. There's nothing wrong with prosthetics. But what I'm saying is that they're tying it into an overall movement that, as you pointed out, relates to diet. It relates to ideology, how you view yourself in the world, your worldview. Uh, it relates to social organization. It relates to tech, smart cities. Uh, the, the social credit system and, and as you pointed out with YouTube and the algorithms and social media, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And eventually it's going to be this, this, this technocratic, I think it's going to be a cult. They're going to turn it into a damn cult. That's my view. What if it's, uh, what if it's, I, mean, I think it's going to be a multitude of cults. Like you're going to see like now with oh, the yeah. internet, right? It's like we have one, I guess you have a meta cult, which, you know, I mean, uh, but yeah, then you have all these little mini cults of people with different preferences. And That's a good point. Yeah, it doesn't have to be one monolithic thing. They could have 50 different cults that are run by the same the same thing. Yeah. So the, this really big word nowadays, and it's always bugged the shit out of me. I make fun of it sometimes. Biohacking. So it's like biohacking. It's biohacking is what you do. It's like when you do normal things to try to be healthy or feel good. Uh, and then you just find like really fancy words to say about it. You can call it biohacking. Like if you're outside and you're just like sunbathing, you can call it photo biomodulation and stuff like well, that. Well, I was gonna say like yeah, like a uh, like life hacks, yeah. <laughs> like crazy life hacks, and it's like how to organize your your junk drawer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, right. And I, I <laughs> totally, I kind of see this. I see this as like you said, the, the changing images of man document. When you look at it, it's kind of. It's a shift in language of how we perceive yes, ourselves. Yes, exactly. Moving us Good away point. from the biological to the mechanistic, the machine. Um, so biohacking, it's like this concept. Uh, you see Dave Asprey, like the Bulletproof Coffee guy. Um, he's really into it. He takes like 100 pills a day because he wants to be 180 years old and never die. And you see this coalescence of like... Ray Kurzweil does that too, by the way. He takes all these pills. Yeah. So, I mean, you, now we're seeing this. I don't know if you pay much attention to it, but it's it's really infiltrating, like, health, fitness, wellness, uh, it, the whole biohacking, quantification. You know, people are wearing continuous glucose monitors, which, is, you know, that's interesting for diabetics and stuff and for seeing how healthy you are. But, I mean, we're talking about Apple is now going to be measuring. Uh, you know, Apple soon is going to come out with a continuous glucose monitor. Well, you're going to be able to monitor stuff in your blood with Did Apple you, products. Have you heard me talk about the Schwitzgabel machine? You've heard us talk about that on Boiler Room? No, that sounds like an okay, anti-Semitic machine. Look up the Schwitzgabel machine, and this is, it sounds like something from a freaking cartoon. It sounds like a Nazi uh, super weapon in, like a, in a cartoon, like the Schwitzgabel yeah. machine. Okay. Uh, so if you look this up, this was in the late sixties, mid seventies, I forget when, but it was, it comes out of the prison industrial complex. Uh, and they started experimenting with putting, um, yeah, tracking, tracing stuff on prisoners. Uh, and it didn't just like track their location. Like if you're under house arrest and you're Britney Spears or something, it actually like it tracked their, uh, heart, heart rate, 
other aspect, their temperature, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so I've got it pulled up right here. Uh, you know, if, if anybody in the audience has access to humanities journals like JSTOR, LexisNexis, uh, I would really appreciate if somebody could hook me up with some, I don't know, maybe there's a sci-hub for this stuff now, but I, I need, I want access to this stuff. I miss my my uh, brainwashed university access to these freaking journals. So I've got... It is nice to have access to those journals. I agree. How I remember you, that. Do you um, get into those anymore? The JSTOR and the LexisNexis? Stuff? No, I don't have access to it anymore. They're so but, expensive um, if you do. You have to buy articles in there too sometimes. I know. They're stupid. They're like $30, $50. Give me a break. I'm not yeah. buying it. But, you're um, going right to Harvard. So yeah, it says right here, an electronic device capable of tracking the wearer's location, transmitting information about activities, communicating with him, and perhaps modifying his behavior. It it's experiment. a prison device that was intended on easing the guard. Like you don't have to have as many guards if we, if everybody's got this device on, and because the the prisoners are going to police themselves, that was the big thing. And this the I watch all. It's this. It's just a Schwitz cable machine. Yeah, absolutely. And this is what's so funny. It's like it's so ironic too. We're sitting here talking to the audience through the Schmitz cable machine to warn them about. The Schwitzgabel machine. Machine. Um, <laughs> so stay away from the Schwitzgabel machine, but be sure to like and subscribe to my channel. <laughs> to the my Schwitzgabel show. Right? <laughs> so be ridiculous. sure to follow the Schwitzgabel machine only when it is privileged health or the show Jay Dyer, the only ones worth watching on this machine that I give you. <laughs> Is that like your 90-year-old Werner Von Braun impression? <laughs> That's my crazy uh, doc. That's what, if you think Dr. Schwitzgabel, that's obviously what he sounds like. <laughs> there you go. It was like a, like a Dr. Strangelove meets Osho. Yeah, and it's, you know, he looks like he's got the, the crazy, crazy Alfred Einstein hair, and he's got the, the white goatee and the lab coat. For and sure, the, yeah. but if it was, it was 1966, so he has to have the round wireframe glasses that are like, you know, <laughs> the, the John Lennon sunglasses. That's Dr. Schwitzgabel! <laughs> All right, so the alchemy of the soy boy. I like this topic. I like this. Oh, so we've got the internet. Oh, 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 oh. Also, uh, back when you were talking about the cybernetics and the the feedback loop, I totally forgot. That's the in, entire thesis of uh, John C. Lilly's book, Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Biocomputer. Mm -hmm. So he starts with the premise that we're just a biological computer, and the brain can be programmed with these feedback loops, and they can re-imprint and reprogram, de-pattern, de uh, re-pattern human beings through giving them LSD. So he thought, you know, LSD is the key to this. It can, it can reset the reboot, the system, and then you can put in the new system. Wow. Now that's, I, I've got to read that book, but from what you've said, it, you it's not very it's readable. Not, it's readable. Yeah. I is mean, it, you can try it, but it's, it's, unreadable it's, it's super expensive too because it's not it's not printed it has been printed since that's because i talked about it and then everybody goes and tries to buy it <laughs> funny like 30 people wanting a book or you know like 100 people wanting a book can jack the price up like four tries four times yeah. on a on the used books um very interesting you know what i think it was an interesting book that connects with and i got this on your recommendation i don't know where it went um the uh, jacques atelier um the brief his history of the future and in that book he talks about there being a class of people that he calls hyper nomads and yeah. how, how that class which is basically us is going to be used as programmers for the population in order to keep populations mobile and moving in this new economy and this new uh, it's i haven't read the entire book yet but from what i've read it's it seems like he's envisioning this constant flow of uh, population in order to break down the borders of all societies and create this global, you know, panopticon. Well, he says that, yeah, he says that what will happen is the global market that's created by the Internet will force people to become hyper nomads. And so there will be a specific class of people that will that will embrace that lifestyle and be forced to it. Um, and then that will, he says, help foster globalization. Yeah. Um, I don't think he thought that very many hyper nomads would be anti globalization. So <laughs> it's such a funny thing because there are there are quite a few people who are using platforms like this to talk about. You know, we're on the Eat Meat Make Family stream right here. We're talking about being healthy, having a healthy worldview. Right. Well, at the, at the, 
at the same time, too, he also says that the future of entertainment and bread and circuses is live streaming. Yes. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody who live streams is, you know, a tech. I mean, I'm not a technocrat. Are you sure? Um, but but yeah, you're right that 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 is it is ironic that we're sitting here doing the very things that Jacques Attali said in 2006 would be the norm 12 years later. I mean, it's, it's something I struggle with, too, man. I live in a small town in the middle of Ecuador. I see... I see, like I'm between worlds in certain ways, right? So you have families that have three generations living in one home. Grandma and grandpa still hang out and babysit everybody. You know, it's like you have family. You've got the prominence of the Roman Catholic Church, for better or worse. Um, I would say for a large part in South America, for better, because it has protected it from a lot of the degeneracy you see in the West sure. with drugs, sure. with transhumanism and stuff like that. But now with the cell phones, the last six years... Um, it, it's, I've seen, we've seen a major difference, you know, the spread of pornography, um, just, it, it, it's interesting to see. And I do get torn. Sometimes I feel, I don't know, man. It's like, I love doing what I do. I get to talk to people all over the world, get to actually help people get to, uh, you know, spread information. But at the same time, it's like, I, I feel weird sometimes because I see the whole new generation of kids coming up and they all want to be internet. They all want to be like, they all want to have their own business on the internet. So every 12 year old on the internet is like hustling, selling t-shirts and shit now, like on Instagram. And it's just, I don't, I don't know where this is all going. It's going to be really, really freaking interesting to see. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I remember in that book, he also talks about, um, that the, the giant global live streaming culture will help foster globalization and that eventually there will be like giant gladiatorial type things like the like hunger games uh um death race if you if you seen death race 2000 that old movie is that from like tarantino and with it death no race? it's like a 70s movie with uh, david carradine and it's it's one of sylvester stallone's first movies no, I'm too, and, too and basically, young. it's just a globally televised death race where people just race cars across a country or something. Yeah. And they try to, like, you know, knock each other out, kill each other and stuff. Uh, it's a goofy dystopian 70s movie. It's pretty good. Maybe yeah. it's 1980, 1980, somewhere in there. Anyway, um, but there's also a. Um, the. the uh, I was reading that they're they they want to start experimenting with this kind of thing with people. In other words, they're going to take like the survivor type TV shows and try to meld that into like the future uh, live streaming thing of like people on an island and you got to actually, you know, dude, uh, they're going to let us actually vote people off the island, but like voting kind of them shit. off is yeah, like that kind of shit. they got to go to carousel if they get voted off. <laughs> yeah, right. you vote them into care, and, then, so. and then you'll get to choose the way like somebody dies or something like i'll put them in the meat grinder and you know <laughs> grind them up for everybody else on the island to eat or some crazy shit like yeah. that well dude they're, they're crazy, normalizing they cannibalism brutal. they're freaking normalizing yes it's cannibalism. brutalized right right so i think you said well how does that fit with veganism well what they could do is they could grind up people into some sort of like uh food substitute type thing I mean, yeah. they, it, Soylent Green, that's what Soylent Green is, is like soy people, <laughs> ground up soy people. Soylent Green is people. Is, the, is that my beeping? No. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought, my, I thought my electricity went out. I heard beeping. These headphones are just confusing the shit out of me, everybody. I hear my own voice in my friggin' headphones. It drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let me jump over here to chat and see what all these friggin' meat tards and nerds are saying. DJ Meat. DJ, DJ Meat. <laughs> Yo, DJ Meat. Just, 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 just steak, 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 steak. <laughs> Dude, all right, we, we need to lighten it up a little bit. Jay, you wanna, you wanna? Let's see if I can get this to work. I've got a few videos pulled up here that I think would be interesting to take a look at. Let's see if the audio feeds through to you with my special setup here. Tell me. Hey, Mason, wanna come? Can up you hear with the audio there? Or else? Oh yeah. Oh, so we gotta. Don't worry about the fishermen. Is that audio coming through to you, Jay? Not so far. It hasn't. Okay. No. okay I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I should have tried to set. We did this. it last time. We How did we do it last. Us? Last time, I uh, well, I could take my headphones off and I could just, yeah. So I'll take the headphones off, and I will play it through here. I wonder if he wants to go live. Hey, Mason, you want to go live? 
How about that? I'm gonna try to get. I'm gonna try to get him to go live with me. Were you able to hear that at all? Uh, I heard a, a Australian dude talking. Okay. I was like, we're on it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like, I thought you had like an Australian producer in the background who was like telling you what to do. Like, <laughs> I wish. I wish. They can't Got hear it. you, mate. They can't <laughs> hear you. What the fuck are you doing, mate? Yeah, well, Australia. If I had an Australian producer, I could say "cunt" freely, because in Australia, every other word is a "cunt" is basically like it's like a uh, it's like it's like "a" uh in Australia, or like in uh, California, like Southern California. When I was growing up, really, really dumb stone kids. Uh, yeah, and I was just like fucking. Uh, I was just like fucking sitting there, and like my he- my head was just like fucking pounding me because I was like so fucking hungover, dude, and fucking, fucking, fucking. All right, let's see. I gotta change my audio preferences. This should work. If I do that, turn it up, <coughs> then I go to multi output device, and then I have to share. share Mel Gibson screen. in the background producing. <laughs> Former Mel Gibson. He totally lost his accent. How cool is that? He evolved. That's proof of evolution right there, isn't it? <laughs> Everything is proof of evolution. There there's ads for for cat food that talks about it being the most evolutionary uh <laughs> i'm not joking there's like there's there's Dar- I, chris hit me to this that there's darwinism in advertising where they'll like try to sell stuff as being the most evolutionary advanced version of cat food or some shit isn't that stupid that's pretty ridiculous all right let's see i'm gonna figure out how to do the video sharing better next time for the audience but if i how do i do screen how'd you do it the first time dude I, th- I don't know how well it worked the first time. All right, I'm gonna share screen with you. It worked good. I saw it. I saw that. I saw that. Uh, <laughs> you saw. You saw. That black dude and his cult with uh, his. Dude, we're about to, we're about to check in on them because I actually haven't looked. I haven't dove down the melanation rabbit hole since uh, since we last hung out. So. Carbonation. That, carbonation, yo! In a sacred society, morals are a must. So this is like to me, this is just the ultimate, the evolution of the soy boy. But like we said earlier, there have to be different cults in the global mega cult. So we've got we've got we've got your boy, master teacher, nature boy, and this is weird. Div- all right, nature boy, that ho. Right. That's like <laughs> instead of soldier boy, it's nature boy. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yo. Peace, reflection. What's going on? Making me dizzy, dog. Okay, I think he might have knocked some chicks up, and they're about to make some Nature Boy babies. Have a little neck breath. Wait, that's a little giraffe. <laughs> that was, that was and then weird. we both have you these. Want to... she flew over. What's that? that was her airplane pillow. I think that's for a baby, Jay. They're about to have babies over at Melanation. Oh, oh okay. shit, dude! They're breeding. Okay. All right. This is this is getting. We got to go to a shorter video. Let's see. I like the introduction. There's too many of these. All right. Belief systems. Should we learn? I mean, what can we learn about here? I want to hear something about. They're all good. I'm sure. What happens when we die? Let's learn about that. In 1982, Melon Thomas died from terminal brain cancer but miraculously lived to tell about it. While showing no vital signs for 90 minutes, Benedict said suddenly he was fully aware and was standing up, but his body was in the bed. He said that being out of his body was so vivid that he could float through every room in his house. There was a light shining and he turned toward the light. The light was very similar to what many other people have described in the near-death experiences. It was so magnificent and you could feel it. It was alluring. You wanted to go to it like you would want to go to your mother or father's arms. He began to move toward the light. He said he knew intuitively that if he went to the light, he would be dead. <laughs> As he was moving towards the Wait, light, where's nature boy? Buddha, Krishna, mandalas, and other images and signs. So <laughs> there we go right away though with like this amalgamation of all religions. Yeah, that, that didn't sound like any other near-death experience story I've ever heard, did it? I believe I can fly. He's floating around. All, and my, then all my favorite cartoon characters was there. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to Pikachu. 
And he told Roger me, Rabbit. Pikachu told me that he did not identify as a male, and I felt bad. I'm trying to find where the, where is his where is this where he he can have his cult and have his harem. I don't really I mean, know. I'm not sure where he went. Aren't harems illegal in a lot of places? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out who the daddy of these babies are. I wish I found some clips and and uh, and time stamped them. But it's like these. The truth about pregnancy with Master Chief Nature Boy. There we go. That's this will clear things up. Okay. Listen up, idiots. Damn, he's fine. That nature boy, fine. A, he know it. God. Yo, yo, yo. He's got that rooster head. La che, la che. Eli. Speaking in tongues. Eli, Eli, Eli. Is it? I don't know. <laughs> la che, la che. La che. La che reflection. <clears throat> la che, la che. Fake Jamaican accent. Eli, 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 Eli. Nice try, Lao Che. I'm troubled. I am not troubled because of me. And the trouble does not vibrate into my EMF. Yet I feel sorrow and troubled for people, for reflections of mine that are vibrating to information that makes no divine order. And structure. We do not understand my art, the way of life, and the fear of Eli. Alright, I'm just gonna say like this so is breaking nonsense. He's this breaking dude just down. strings together nonsense. Dude, basically. he used to be able to hold it together and like give you an hour of some funny shit. Now he's like fucking broken apart. What the hell's on with this guy? Too much ayahuasca. Well, maybe not enough ayahuasca, according to some of the people in the chat. Let's see. I mean, he went to the wrong shaman. Let's see. Gonna connect. Beautiful, beautiful people. My reflections. Look at those so, eyes. He said, that's, we don't know, Le, we forgot. That's LeBong. LeBong James. Right there. <laughs> LeBong James. Dude, I can't. I feel bad because Nature Boy used to be a good laugh. And now I feel like he's like fucking got dementia. Let's he's see. losing it, yeah. Well, here's, here he is out in the sun activating his superior melanin. Let's see what happens okay. when he – maybe he can think clearer. If we have a painful life, it's yeah. because what? That's my boy right there. He's back. Okay. Woo! Nature Boy. You see? Woo! <laughs> you wonder why you live your life in labor. In toil. In the Bible, Jesus said, look into the fields. The birds, they do not sow nor weep. They don't weep. Look at weep. the clothes that the flowers uh, wear. Me, the doves do cry, Prince told me. <laughs> they do not I hear the birds crying right now, Nature Boy. I think they don't reap. I labor nor toil. Yet Eli has dressed them better than Solomon in all of his splendor. You see? We don't understand our being. We don't understand pregnancy, and so therefore we, we have a complicated birth, and the transition of our birth is complicated because we live in the mind of something complicated. Everything we do, we complicate it. You understand? We were told that birth is supposed to, pregnancy is supposed to be painful. We were told. I don't know. I'm going to have to look up these terms. Have you ever heard of Vernon Howard? He reminds me. He's like the black version of Vernon Howard, who's one of the first gurus of this kind of crap. Like the the say a bunch of words that, that mean absolutely nothing approach. I thought, to, I thought Charlie to running, Manson was the. To running a cult. <laughs> I thought that was Manson's thing. Uh, I think Vernon Howard precedes Manson, but Vernon had a more of a, like, you know, boomer wear, wear a tie and suit, you know, kind uh -huh. of. Uh-huh. He was more, uh, yeah, like he, he looked, he dressed the part better than, than Charles. It didn't give the hippie vibe. It was like before the hippie stuff, there was the, or maybe around the same time, like the, the self-improvement, um, uh, uh, positive thinking movement, that kind of crap. Norman yes. Vincent Peale crap. Yes, that makes sense. So I've got another one pulled up here. This one's 
This is a very impassioned speech from like one of the most popular vegan activists. Oh, Earth, my gosh. Earthling Ed. Um, you can also see Earthling Ed debating people in the street. Well, maybe let's let's see this clip of Earthling Ed first. I'm still screen sharing with you. You should be able to see it. Um, let's let's see. Not entertainment. Oh, hey, So just to clarify, so just to clarify, you'll shout abuse at young girls, but you won't have a conversation with me. You're wrong. Back up. Uh, so what's Back wrong? Up. So should, just to clarify, would you like to have a conversation? Because uh, it's funny that because when someone invites you for a conversation, oh, no one wants it. So hang on. So you were shouting abuse at these young girls. No, no, no. I just like to have a chat. It's, no, it's funny. It's just because when when someone wants to have a chat, you don't want to do it. So hang on. When someone wants to chat to you, you tell them to fuck off. Though. No, 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 this is fine, gonna, this is fine. He's going to uh, debate the wrong guy in Texas and get his... <laughs> you keep waiting for that, actually. He's going to get his he gonna get his ponytail knocked off. <laughs> his man bun's going to get disheveled. He's pissing these guys off. I get that, I get that. I don't want to do it. I get it, I get it, I get it. I get it, I get it, I get it. I get it, I get it. So there's... Earthling Ed, just the, the shining example of modern masculinity. <laughs> I mean, he he's, he'd probably be really good friends with Kevin of uh, of of the uh, masculinity is dead, dad. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen that video. We did watch it at one point on this channel. The masculinity is dead. Um, so yeah, that's that's Earthling Ed. But here's his speech. He gave this very impassioned speech in front of supposedly ten thousand vegans. Um, so 10,000 vegans showed up for a march for the animals, and he gave an impassioned speech. There's two versions. This one. Can you feel it as it flows and as it cascades? Can you feel it as it transmutes from something that we only used to be able to dream of to something that exists in front of us, something we can see, something that is tangible? Change. The change that is coming. It is palpable. It exists in the hearts and minds of each and every one of us. Feel it. Believe it. The change is coming. The sun will one day set on this world and a new dawn will rise. Out, out of the ashes of violence, hope will rise. Now we as a movement exist in the millions of individuals, but together we move as one. I mean, this is like and right as one, we can right out of the mind of, of uh, Toffler. I mean, this is what Toffler envisioned right here. We as a movement, we as a people, we as a culture, millions of us. Yeah, yeah, we're all one organism. You know, be the change you want to see. It's like a lot of these empty words, right? Like Tony Robbins Jr. It is. It's all, yeah, modeled on the, the self-help teacher stuff, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's a really interesting part of this. Now you do see this coming together. Now, uh, this here's a better version. This is this guy Medicine. is actually a vegan. The sun will one day set on music. this world and a new dawn will rise. Out of the ashes of violence, hope will rise. Can you feel it as it transmutes from something that we only used to be able to dream of to something that exists in front of us, something we can see, something that is tangible? Change. The change that is coming. Clown college. I'm not going to enroll in that clown college. That advertisement had no effect on me. And they should fear us. But every single day, the, our the numbers grow stronger. Our soil wars. Oh. Uh, another vegan YouTuber, his name is uh, uh, Lesio, edited this video together with basically showing all the clips of like James Aspie and these other vegans who have Patreon accounts. Uh, how they spend their money basically living like they're on fucking vacation all day. Um, <laughs> er Earthling Ed makes like 10 grand a month off of Patreon. Oh, and this guy goes around. So this is kind of an ironic video made by a, a beautiful con man. This guy is actually pretty reasonable. The guy who made this video, he's a vegan guy. Uh, you know, obviously don't agree with his uh, worldview and stuff, but he he critiques a lot of these vegan activists, and he's pretty smart. I actually, I always thought it would be fun to have him on with you and hear you guys kind of flesh out ideas because he calls himself a nihilist, 
and he's like to, like a moral relativist. Oh, but yeah, you mentioned him. He's yeah, an I'll, interesting I'll, guy. He's I'll a, come on and do whatever. Yeah, he's a smart guy. I, I don't I don't I tried to get in, uh, to a hold of him. He might have just blocked me. I don't know. I don't think vegans like I don't think they like to come out of their their circles and talk. But uh, uh, for the audience tomorrow. Well, Earthling Ed was trying to debate a bunch of rednecks. He ought to. Yeah, he does like to do that. But I think uh, the the guy who made this video, I'm not sure. But I'm I'm gonna try to get a hold of him. So if anybody knows Eisel, um, get a, get in touch with him. I'd love to have him on. Just talk to him about the vegan movement and what he thinks about it. Um, Fiction grows harder, and that change becomes ever more inevitable than it was the day previous. And they fear us because they know that we will not stop fighting. That we will never. <laughs> We will not stop making response videos. We will never stop commenting on your YouTube videos and telling you you're going to die of a heart attack. We will never stop. <laughs> yeah, we, we, everyone's, the, the system is trembling in fear <laughs> given the fact that you're promoting the system's message, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, trembling. Tyson Foods and, and Cargill who are pumping billions of dollars into plant-based uh, food alternatives. Yeah, and yeah so they're and trembling. Swap. Yeah, um, yeah pre pretty absurd. Now there there was an interesting. Here's we've got another we've got another video pulled up here. Let's see if this one's more interesting than than Earthling Ed. This is uh these people are pretty fun. Hey, I'm Angie. And I'm Brian. And we're happy, happy healthy, healthy vegan. vegan. So I've been getting a lot of messages from you guys over on Instagram and Facebook and stuff asking us to do a video about Prop 12. Well, we're no political analysts or anything, but I figured Ryan could probably do a little research for it. Yeah, yeah. As vegans, we are confused too. Which side should we vote for? Yes or no on Prop 12? So let's break it down. So California Prop 12 establishes new minimum space requirements for confining veal calves, breeding pigs, and egg laying hens. And to understand why Prop 12... I guess there's a new vegan activism, yeah. you know, like just voting on stupid fake bills that, you know, uh, these huge NGOs put out. Um, this, this bill, when you actually look at it and I'm not as a non-vegan, I obviously I'm not very well researched on this, but like California department of food and agriculture seems to be kind of trying to increase the price of meat products with this bill, in my opinion. Um, you know, it, it does seem like that's what's going on is they're basically, they want larger cages for hens and stuff, which, you know, I mean, the, the modern food system of, you know, factory farming sucks. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's an interesting dialectic that's happening where it seems like, you know, I mean, you're, if you threw a proposition like this or to increase the price of meat and poultry dramatically, this definitely feeds right into the hands of this kind of austerity, uh, yes. you know, feed the soil and slaughter right. people agenda. So they're, they're talking about this bill. And square feet and furthermore Ooh, it bans the sale i'm all tripped up by this couple it's like gay jack gay jackie chan and who does she look like she man who's she it's kind of a bummer a decade ago we thought we were voting for cage-free housing and yeah <laughs> here we are like a decade later yeah. like, <laughs> she's, like, like, she's a 50-year-old 14 year old so if a 50 year old 14 year old yeah he's gay jackie chan okay it gives small farmers a year to get ready for us. By 2020, chicken cages will have to go from the current 116 square inches up to 144 square inches, about a 25% space increase. But it doesn't end there. The whole goal is by 2022, the all chickens in this state will be cage free. Well, that's an improvement. Yeah, so we're gonna go from something that looks <laughs> like this to something that looks more like this. And as far as so we searched on Google and we found a picture that we think represents what we feel when we read the language <laughs> of this. <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. Good point. I mean, I don't know, man. It's, it's this is like the future of voting, I guess, is like YouTubers are going to tell everybody. <laughs> like, that's, a, that's what it is. Yeah. It's like who's got the most uh, um, emotionally that doesn't emotionally move me at all. But that's intended to emotionally you know, trigger uh, the soy boys. By the way, if you grind up a soy boy and eat him, is that vegan or is that cannibalism? Well, humans, that's a really good point. That's actually a really good point. Most vegans I don't think would be opposed to cannibalism. Uh, well, <laughs> they make the argument that it's all the same. So it's to eat those chickens, it's the same as 
as uh, as not eating. Well, or, you know, on our when we did this uh, this uh, show last time, you and I, when I was on with you, and I put the video up, I got comments from the vegan saying, "You are murderous. You are guilty of you. You. Yeah. I like the the equation of serial killer. Do you get this? Like, hmm. you are like a serial killer. You're just yeah. a version of serial killer." There was a post the other day, and it was like, if we killed, all right, if people killed as many humans in one day as they do animals, we would be extinct in a month. <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's like, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, but, I mean, these are meaningful statements to some people somehow. Um, dude, J- Jay, I, tomorrow, so I've been challenged, you guys. Vegan foot soldier, this lovely gentleman right here, um, he has challenged me to a debate many times. He wants to debate me so bad. I really have. Oh yeah. Oh shit. I got. I have such. Awesome. I have such a small. There's such a small part of me that has an interest in like online debate, right? especially with vegans, because first. Is that Nassim Amik them? <laughs> is that him? I think it's Nassim's boyfriend. <laughs> it's her ex boyfriend. That's why he asked to cover his identity. I think um, got, she had more. She has more muscle than he does. I, well, he's uh, he's somebody has mentioned that before, and he emphatically stated in the comment section on my video that he was commenting on that it's because he's a cyclist. That's uh, that's why he's so skinny. It's not because of veganism. He doesn't show his face here. I wish he'd show his face. Um, so yeah, he, he he threw he called me out a couple times. He misrepresented me. He said that I was a uh, a fundamentalist Christian. Which I, I definitely don't uh, identify as. I don't. I mean, what do you mean by fundamentalist? I guess right. So I'm a fundamentalist Christian. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I tend towards more of like an Eastern or Eastern Orthodoxy, um, you know, interpretation of Scripture. And uh, but so he called me a fundamentalist Christian. This is his. Uh, Some people say that vegans are dogmatic and veganism is like a religion. Well, that doesn't make sense in the same way that atheism is a religion. Atheism can't be a religion because religion is believing something on insufficient evidence, whereas atheism is not believing stuff without sufficient evidence to believe in things. So the thing is, atheism is rational because you don't just believe things willy nilly, whereas religion is irrational rational because you believe in magical sky wizards without any evidence whatsoever to do so. So that's the same thing with veganism. Jay, I know that this is probably way outside of your depth. I mean, you're, you got, you, or you almost had, you, you, you stopped at your thesis, you got over it, but you were going to do a master's in philosophy or heavy, heavily studied in well, I got everything awesome. done, and then and then right in the middle of the thesis, my uh, advisor was trying to sabotage it. We almost got into a fist fight, so I just left. I had a similar end in my my university career. No, no, almost fist fights, but I definitely, I definitely went out kicking and screaming from the university system, like "fuck this place." Um, what, what do you think about what he just said there? Does that make much sense to you? <laughs> this looks like the typical YouTube buffoon. I mean, I. This would be this would be a uh, basic bitch level one steamroll debate. So first of all, he mischaracterizes God and defines God as a magical sky wizard, in the, uh, so that he can then straw man the concept of God, which is always funny when atheists try to do that. Um, mm-hmm. And then he, you know, he he keeps talking about it's irrational, it's irrational, whereas atheism is is rational. Um, <laughs> let's let's continue. Let's see where else he goes with this argument because I think he's going to go real deep here. You might just blow your mind and turn you, uh, turn you back to a rat. It looks like some kind of weird Jap thing, like like a Japanese game show or something. Like he's yeah. a Japanese game show mixed with uh, Nassim Amigdam or something. Uh, this is this is actually I think this is the Antifa branch of animal the, the animal rights branch of Antifa. Uh, it seems that this guy, vegan foot soldier, um, seems to represent. He covers his face because I don't know why. Uh, I guess that's just like his character on YouTube. So oh, okay. I don't know. I mean, he that's his shtick. He says it's because he doesn't want to lose his job and get doxxed. But it's like, um, 
I don't know. I don't think Starbucks really discriminates against. Yeah, I mean, who like who cares? <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure your job. You have the most system type view. Like, what? Who's gonna dox you? Like, why would you get fired for this? Dude, I don't know. It might be really controversial. He would I, get promoted. He ought to put his face out there. He'd get promoted. I just don't get like what I don't know. He probably like sweeps the freaking grocery store in the middle of the night or something or like. I mean, what is this guy doing for a job? Obviously, it's not off. physical. He's ripping off sticks a little bit because he's doing the, the bare chest. This is He is kind of ripping sticks. Sticks stick. That's true. And but at least sticks can sound Pull intelligent trying to argue atheism. Right. Um I do kind of like sticks. This let's see what else he's got to say. He makes some funny arguments here. Is meat eating. And I'm gonna make a case for that in this video. So stay tuned. So let's Why give a few examples. Skinny, why is it I'm all skinny start... British boys trying to tell us how we're supposed to live? Here, um, first of all, looking at the lipids. This guy is such an insufferable dickhead. I could video on him, but let's just look at this one clip because he's about. So are you gonna are you gonna debate him? I love to ride my bicycle. I love to ride my bike. He's going to he's going to do figure eights around you in his cycle. I think it'd probably be a, fun. I think it's going to be fun. Probably a tricycle. We're going he's going to be on tomorrow. So Vegan Foot Soldier tomorrow at 12 o'clock East Central Ooh. Standard Time. Vegan Foot Soldier is going to come on and intellectually crush me and probably just I don't know. I mean, I I'm almost convinced right now to go vegan just from this man and his boxers. And his beautiful long torso. He's like seven foot tall. Or he's just so skinny it makes him look tall. Um, but I do like the sock on the face. That's really cute. Uh, kinky. I like it. Um, I can. It seems like he does some manscaping. Like that's, you know, it's respectable manscaping there. So, you know, he's, I'm going to give him the platform. Maybe I'll give him the keys to my channel if he wins the, uh, the exchange. Let's see what else <laughs> he has to say. Guy is such an insufferable dickhead. I could make an entire video on him, but let. I, I just love how he says that with the lisp and everything. The guy. I bet is... this shit had this shit had probably has ten more. He probably has ten times the subscriber base I do. No, he's got he's got eight k views, but he gets a eight oh, okay. k subscribers, but he does get quite a bit of views. He probably gets more views than me on his videos because all these vegans there's there's huge hordes of these vegans. But I love yeah. that. I, I'm gonna, I want to take a clip. I want to get a gif of that or something. This guy is such an insufferable dickhead. That's, that's perfect. This guy is such an insufferable dickhead. Love it. Let's keep, let's keep going. Let's look at this one clip because he's about to tell us how high his cholesterol levels are. Checking them lipids. Let's see. All right. LDL. Still about the same. My LDL on a ketogenic diet is generally high. So I'm not particularly shocked that someone who thinks eating raw eggs and eating raw meat is a good idea has high cholesterol levels. But in fact, this guy's LDL cholesterol levels Look are so at his fucking ridiculously body, absurdly his higher. I would not be surprised at all if he died of a heart like attack in his 40s. A fucking so human toothpick? I mean, come on. This it's, is preposterous. It's like if you want to get a real physique like Kurt Cobain after his second album, you need to get on a vegan diet. I think that that must be why he wears the sock hat. I think he's Kurt Cobain faked his death and found a way to reverse the aging process using a vegan diet. Um, that's my theory on the. Uh, Remember heroin chic? Remember in the '90s and 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 the 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 supermodels yeah. brought heroin chic in. You had yeah. to look like you were. Yeah, it's like this is what the vegan soy boy look is. Is mm -hmm. this just? I mean, they, they, their arms are like. They're like rectangular, you know what I mean? They don't have, there's no muscle there. It's Dude, just, but if you take an elbow, that's a sharp-ass elbow. Like, he might yeah. cut you with that elbow. I mean, really slowly, he'll slice you. Not like, not <laughs> like you, you just, <laughs> like, literally razor sharp. <laughs> It also comes as no surprise that this guy is a fundamentalist Christian and he believes that global warming is a conspiracy theory and he doesn't think that overpopulation is an issue at all because one of the things he likes to say is something along the lines of go forth and multiply. 
I guess that's in line with his Christian fundamentalist dogma. But this guy goes a step further. He has to purge his entire channel of rational thought. Not only does he block people who disagree with him, he blocks people who might just possibly be disagreeing with him, but he's too stupid to figure out if they are actually disagreeing with him or not. Sometimes people will make a comment. That's true. Like, that's all true. Know if you're talking shit or not, but I'm going to ban you just in case. For example, he ended up blocking his keto raw meat eating chums ferridge because he couldn't even decipher whether he was actually on his side or not. So let's listen now to what he blocked him over. There's innocent bystanders that I, that I respect, like Sverridge, who I accidentally banned for some reason. Do you remember why? Yeah, I actually do. It was uh, when the earthquake happened because you always made your videos without a t-shirt and it was the first video with a t-shirt and I was the first one to comment nice t-shirt and you somehow get offended by it <laughs> and as we mentioned Sverridge someone who also consumes raw animal products that, that's all he really says about me that's the end of the call out uh, then he talks about Sverridge because Sverridge is like a flat earth guy so then he, he lumps me in with all these other people's beliefs to try and weave his story which is funny, but I mean, we'll, we'll see. I told him he's got to use video if he comes on. I don't want to d talk to an icon um, of a uh, cartoon character of an Antifa vegan. But mm -hmm. he's, he's going to come on and we'll, we'll have a little debate ski tomorrow, guys. So you guys can come join us talking with Vegan Foot Soldier tomorrow, 12 o'clock Central Standard Time. He's going to enlighten me. He's going to woke me. I'm going to do my best to... Uh, to present my point of view and, um, you know, defend the sky wizard. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that, that'll be interesting. There's another character, though. Well, uh, just just remind him that the the same basis that he thinks gives rise to uh, moral absolutes, such as that you shouldn't eat meat, seem to require something beyond the physical here and now. So in other words, a moral absolute is not physical. He believes in moral absolutes, right? He's a foot soldier for this cause. He believes it's a universally binding moral principle. But universally binding moral principles, they aren't material, are they? No, they, they seem to be like these magical sky wizards that he has a problem with. Well, he has, he has no problem conjuring up the magical sky reason. Magical sky exactly. reason and logic. Um, these are, you know, truth, logic. I mean, these are metaphysical concepts, so I'm not sure. He looks like a corpse. His body has already begun to atrophy, so he's he's Kurt Cobain, like, now. <laughs> Kurt Cobain dead. But, I, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's really sad to see. I mean, you do see. And, you know, I, mean, I told the guy. Like, he, he sent me a message. He keeps, he's like, debate me, bro, debate me. I mean, he, he posts comments on videos. Who do you think will die first, Prime Alleged Health or Sean Baker? Uh, and you know, the, the vegans have I a think good he's life. already dead. He's, he's already. <laughs> That's what's so sad. It's like, look, I could die tomorrow. I could die in a week. I could die in a year. I've got a beautiful family with beautiful children, amazing memories. I have faith in God. And I believe that what I'm doing is sometimes decent. <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm trying to do something good. So it's like, I, I don't know this whole, this whole thing of, uh, never of being afraid of death. I think is an interesting thing with the vegan. Uh, well, they're almost all Darwinist in a very strict, radical sense, and many, many are atheists, obviously. Why is anything wrong? Why, why are we not just being, striving to be, you know, apex predators and, you know, I mean, I should, I should, you should go eat this guy. Like, you should go just murder this guy, eat him, move on to the next soy boy. Like, why not? What, there's, there's no, there's no... You may not like it. He may not like it, but hey, he actually he probably would like you. There actually are some fetishists who have the fetish of, of being eaten. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of that story that uh, that guy who was uh, Dutch, Belgian. I forget. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you hear me? I'm echoing. But uh, this uh, the guy who met people on Cannibal Cafe. And and got this guy to agree to let him be eaten. 
That's so funny. There's a, there's a and few they, other and stories. And they, they tried to charge the guy. I can't remember what the court decision was, but they were like, well, he did consensually <laughs> want to be eaten. <laughs> he signed a thing. So when the uh, cannibal ate him, uh, what, what, what do we do here? It, what I'm saying is that the reason it applies to this guy is like, we're atheists. Darwinism is true. It's apex predators. Well, come on. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like might makes right. Survival yeah. of the fittest. The triumph of the will. <laughs> These people don't realize that the, they, they don't understand what their worldview actually is. That's the thing. They don't exactly. bother actually fleshing out their worldview. It's just kind of like right. piecemeal. I guess it's, you know, the, we're talking about the tapestry of a soy boy or the alchemy of a soy boy. Maybe it's more <laughs> like a it's more like a big rug made out of the pubic hairs of a million gurus. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you've got Osho's pubes. You've got you've got Crowley pubes up in there. You got some some Tim Leary pubes. You at got... least the but but at least the uh, you know to have pubes you actually have to reach puberty. Yeah. And the cult leaders at least appear to reach puberty. The the minions out here, the foot soldiers, don't even appear to reach puberty yet. Well, let's let's see what else he has to say because this was the more interesting video, and he makes some very powerful theological arguments in this one, Jay. Let's see what he has to say. You what? Donut Gate's not real. But I, th I thought Earth in it. You, remember, you know, not, you know what real. he looks like? Do you remember He Man? He's Orco, dude. <laughs> he's that, vegan Orco. Uh, animals, he's, animal he's, life has the same, have the same value as human life. So here we have a French Christian who's arguing for the animal holocaust. At one point, he even says that he eats nothing but meat. But anyway, he starts off by saying that vegans think all animals are the same. So Ursula Ed naturally responds like a boss. It's not necessary that the, the lives are the same. I just think that that right to life is equal. Now, and I also say to people that that doesn't define being vegan. To be vegan, you don't have to say that the life of a pig or a cow or a chicken is equal to the life of a human. All you have to acknowledge really is that the life of a pig, a cow or a chicken is higher than your taste buds or higher than the 15 minutes of pleasure you get from higher. consuming their flesh. But then That's a typical earthling mad argument. I mean, what do you think about that argument? Well, it's fraught with kind of metaphysical assumptions. Um, I mean, I within my belief system, I could say, yeah, the, a, a pig has more sentience than... Uh, than a, a carrot or something, but but uh, it's a value judgment to turn around and say that that it's somehow wrong to eat meat because a pig has a higher uh, level of sentience than than something from the vegetable kingdom, and there's there's no reason to believe that. So in other words, it's fraught with a lot of still assumptions about uh, right and wrong and, and making value judgments, and none of these systems can can justify making a value judgment at all. It's all just personal taste. Yeah, absolutely agree. It's a great way of saying it. Topic quickly goes down an appeal to species rabbit hole where the guy is saying humans are better than other animals because God said so. Basically, do you believe that we are all kind of animals? We are all animals, yes. Humans are animals. From Yes. Okay. There is no book where it's written than that, that uh, animal uh, life has more value than, than uh, plant life. And I believe that humans are of a higher value and intrinsically superior than other all other forms of life. And I'm not saying... Can you tell me why? Can you tell believe. me why? Well, because I believe in the Bible. And but I, what about the Bible says, what about being human makes you better than, makes, your, makes you more superior? In terms of your, but not just superior in terms of... The, the Bible and how it shapes this idea. Well, explain to me, why, well, why, why is your life higher? Why, because God said so, because God created humans that way. So as humans, we have a brain that allows us to think. We have a heart that pumps blood around our bodies. We have legs for walking, arms for picking stuff up, eyes okay, for well, seeing, they nose. They have the same. The same. Animals, the pigs same have the same. So we're the same because we have body parts. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is arguing from parts to whole. So just because we have similar aspects to other things, we're the same. I mean, that's that's retarded. That's like because we have similar DNA to lizards, we're lizards. I mean, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, similarity does not equal uh, identity. So, I mean, that's just basic and fallacy. And how do you even determine similarity? It's like, you know, you look at any biological organism, like you could say a freaking 
well, look, a lizard has a hand. <laughs> you know, you know look, good look, point. Yeah, I mean, a, a worm has some sort of sensation. So we're worms that we have sensation. It, I mean, utterly stupid arguments. I mean, and also, like I guess this. another way to attack that would be like, you know, the assumption of materialism. Like, okay, so all that exists is material bodies, and that's how we determine what is true and what is real is we have material bodies. So, okay, we've mm -hmm. got these material bodies. The lions also have a body. The lions got a mouth. The lions, you know, they get to kill and eat animals. What makes us different? What makes us morally, age? What's, what gives us moral agency? Right. In other words, the the position of the atheist vegan assumes that there are moral absolutes and that humans are uh, liable for their actions. They actually have guilt. They have responsibility. But responsibility requires you to have some sort of special aspect to your being that we don't uh, accrue to animals. We don't say animals are liable or or guilty for when they eat other animals, right? So in other words, the vegan needs the idea of man being made in the image of God to have his moral stance to deny God uh, creating man or man being made in the image of God. So it's utterly ridiculous. All right, so they, they want it both ways. Oh, we're just animals, yeah. correct? We're just animals. Okay, then if you concede that humans are animals or you know humans can be categorized as animals, so then what makes it different? Why can animals eat animals and humans can't? They still have to explain their vegan version. Because it's not human, man. It's not humane, bro. You're not a natural it's not meat humane. eater. <laughs> but you're not a natural meat eater. Dude, this guy has the most obnoxiously effeminate voice I've ever heard. It's like there's not many voice. You know, vegan foot soldier, he's funny. Like I, I think that he's cheeky. He's funny. He throws on a funny costume. Vegan foot soldier, come on the channel. But dude, Earthling, Ed. Oh man, I, the the words that I would use to describe your voice would get me deplatformed from YouTube. Um, but man, what a let's see a little bit more of this uh, this argument. It gets even better. Of course, Ed responds to this in a decent way, bringing up the similarities between us and other animals. But I felt that this was such an important point in this debate, and it kept coming back to this. But I felt, for some reason, I wasn't disappointed with Ed because Ed's such a good debater, and he brings up such good points, and he's so solid in pretty much every regard debating veganism. But I feel there could have been another alleyway that he could have gone down, another way of explaining this, which I personally think of my worked a bit better on this guy and I'm going to explain that in this video and if you know this argument because I've talked about this before you might be familiar with this but I'm going to give a bit more of an example of how I would have responded in this situation and by saying that I'm not saying that Ed responded badly in this uh, situation I think he responded well but I think you could have refuted the point a bit more concretely yeah, using my version of an appeal to species debunk than what Ed came up with because Ed was sort of more appealing to uh, similarities and emotions okay, and stuff maybe like I'm this, not whereas my way around. of this doing it would be annoying. debunking the core concept of what the I other guy had in his mind yeah, so the first thing I would ask him in order to debunk this circular appeal to species would be do you deny the thing theory of evolution and thankfully he says I think around 34 minutes in this debate that he does not reject science because he, he says something like I'm not a science denier obviously so I'm not science a science denier so then we're on evolution. solid ground to start with but then if he goes on and says no I actually deny the theory of evolution then you can't argue with him about anything because it's like trying to argue with someone that 2 plus 2 equals 4 when they're saying that 2 plus 2 equals 5 if they're going to sit there and argue that 2 plus 2 equals 5 then you can't really argue about anything because it's such a basic stupid like, <laughs> like how are you going to argue that no uh, here's two stones here's two other stones we put the stone together how many stones are there there's four stones no there's five stones there <laughs> like you can't argue with that so if he denies the theory of evolution then i would say at that point you just stop the conversation and say okay mate okay have a nice day <laughs> on your way so then we need to ask him if racism is good or bad That's if he thinks that racism so, so again good, then we can notice the religious foundations of evolution here uh, if a person denies it, is critical of it, doubtful of it, which I guarantee you this guy couldn't even really have a, a coherent... He has no coherent argument for evolution. If about you about actually, the philosophy of yeah, it, so the history actually, of it. Exactly. Right. So, you know, the, it, show me the hard science behind that. So it's always treated as a religious dogma um, because if you start talking about natural selection, actually natural selection is compatible with, with creation. There's no reason why God can't uh, have 
a situation where certain species, uh, you know, go extinct, others are fittest and they survive. I mean, we see this in the animal kingdom. That's not evolution. Evolution in its traditional form specifically says its central key dogma is the transmutation of species. Exactly. The goo species, turns into a shrew. The cosmic and, goo becomes a shrew. Becomes and, you. And, and, Right, and there's absolutely no evidence for this. And DNA, RNA, it does not code for a new animal. Anything that's in a whale will always only code for a whale. You are never going to get a bear coding in a whale, period. It's not possible because the code is not there. It's all. It's only on and off switches that either tur are turned on or turned off. Exactly, so and they exist. They're pre-existent. So how would a so yes, code it's become into being? Impossible. From right, unless... There was like, uh, you know, a mad scientist interjecting, you know, uh, fish DNA into a, well, panspermia, a tomato. Panspermia, the Anunnaki. Yeah, you have to. And by the way, a lot of them do believe in this. They actually go to, well, if that's the best way to, to defend Darwinism, then like Dawkins and, 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 and uh, Stephen Hawking, and they all end up going into panspermia because they, they think that makes, makes more sense as a theory. So actually, again, and when Darwinism collapses into panspermia, we're justifying this shit with fucking metaphysical alien bullshit, dude. That is a religion. That's a cult. Yeah, no, it, it, it's really, it's kind of sad though how, how, <laughs> the mentality of people works, right? It's like you, I mean, he he says this is a debate. He's talking about a debate, and his only point in this whole video is, you can't debate somebody who doesn't take for granted that you know i mean what, we, who even knows what his version of the theory of evolution is that's the thing i mean this guy probably has no idea what orthodox evolutionary theory even holds today he probably isn't well versed in you know the biology and you know the uh, the, the scientific worldview of today he's just calling upon it just like a deity like he's conjuring up this metaphysical concept of absolute truth through science and yeah. then, you know, his voice even cracks at the end there because he probably realized just how absurd. This is a key point. This is a key point that every worldview has some faith based area of commitment at its foundational presuppositional level. So so no matter what you believe, at some point in your system, you're going to to have something that you can't evidentially or empirically back up. This is true for any any worldview basically because of human finitude. We're finite. We can't empirically verify everything. It's not possible. You can't em empirically verify uh, very abstract mathematical principles, and they're, but they're obviously true. You can't empirically verify something as simple as a moral uh, absolute or something as simple as that the, the something outside of your immediate experience exists, right? I mean, I, don't, I haven't been to China, uh, but I have absolutely every reasonable basis to believe that China exists, right? But if I'm only going to believe in empiricism, which most of these people do in a very strict sense, you can't even justify the existence of something outside your immediate perception, including the past. So people that don't study philosophy, they don't know all of these kinds of angles and questions that, again, reduce this down to absurdity and show that even in the midst of this guy's few minutes, he doesn't even realize that he's relying on things that go beyond sense data that he he trusts in in a, in a very almost religious sense, things like evolutionary theory, which is a very grand, grand scale, grand scope analysis and, and projection upon history and the future about man and his origins. It's not a, an empirically based thing. When you start talking about the empirically based stuff from DNA or from biology and life sciences, that's different. That's not the same thing as the, uh, one billion years ago, this species became a different species. There's absolutely zero, none whatsoever evidence for that. And historically, all the evidences that have been put forward, Piltdown Man, Nebraska Man, they're all known frauds. But you clearly haven't read the scientific literature like Richard Dawkins, you idiot, you fucking insufferable fool. How come Dawkins Dawkins has contradicted himself within one decade? For example, junk DNA ten years ago, the clips on YouTube, and he says there's no such thing as junk DNA. Uh, I never said junk DNA proved evolution. Junk DNA doesn't exist. It proves evolutionary theory that it's not true. And then you go back ten years ago, and he says there's junk DNA, and it proves vestigial organs. It proves useless junk DNA. So he's literally like within 10 years, and he denies that he ever said the opposite when the quotes, the, the clips are right next to each other. So 
Richard Dawkins is nothing but a propagandist. It's really it's funny though. I mean, it's and this is I mean, when you look at YouTube like v, uh, vegan YouTube or even like uh, you know evangelical atheist YouTube, it's funny because there's so much uh, there there's so much of this really poor argumentation. And it's that these are very cr close worlds to one another. A lot of the 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 dying skeptic community, by the way, this this the YouTube skeptic atheist community, which is dwindling. Uh, they come to very they they cross over very well with the vegans. I mean, again, yeah. all of this this horde of mindless vegans, they're almost all uh, rabid Darwinists who yeah. don't question it at all. Well, check out this PETA ad. Can you see that? I got a, we're a screen sharing yeah. right now. We got the what if aliens tested on humans? And this is a common argument from vegans is if aliens came here, would it be okay if they ate you? Right. This assumes moral absolutes and the the fact that it's it's wrong to do certain actions and their entire worldview negates the possibility of moral absolutes. It's, it's, it's a really a no brainer. All right, wait, let's see. Whoops. But I'm glad that you're pointing all this out. Cause I mean, I don't even realize how much this is like how prevalent this is. This is, this is being promoted everywhere. Like veganism is just like being blasted out through all propaganda media outlets everywhere now it's 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 everywhere this is crazy yeah no it's full on i mean well it's a part of the transhumanist thing as well yeah. i mean how can you convince right. people that they're you have to convince people that they're useless machines if you want to turn them into useless machines exactly exactly you watched the new blade runner the sec the, the reboot what do you think about that uh i did i did a little video on it because my here's my theory on on the the replicants from blade runner i think what what you could do within that universe, and I think it's really interesting when you look at you know they're all they're using behaviorist programming in mm -hmm. uh, you know to program what's the guy's name uh, Ryan Gosling's character the Ryan Gosling character yeah, yeah when he goes in he's talking to the AI cells yeah. within cells within cells you know, what does it feel like to love did you you know it's like just weird just you know, repetitive linguistic uh, things with the flashing light and the two thousand one right. Space Odyssey camera looking eye thing uh, so you have all that going on and then. When you have, you know, the the uh, kind of villain character in the movie who's, you know, maybe probably a hero to the transhumanist types, but uh, Jared Leto's character. Jared Leto, yeah. Yeah, when he, like, cuts open the womb of that woman, you know, sacrifices the woman, uh, you know, at that, that one moment, you can see that they're, like, they're, they're biological, right? With these, they're not, they don't seem to be just piecemeal, put together homunculus, like, put together mm -hmm. from robotics. They seem to be biological creatures and it's very possible within that realm you know that sci-fi reality i think it would be a great twist if they made it so that the replicants really are just people and they you know they just had to be so dehumanized and programmed since birth when they mm. were biologically born and that you can you know sterilizing sterile agents and stuff like that huh. to uh that i don't know how they could tie that in they might not be able to tie up all the loose ends with that but i, I think it could fit i think it could work that the the replicants are humans and they're just so dehumanized that they believe that they're sterile, functionless uh, automatons. You could write the fan fiction. Yeah. yeah. I think it would deviate from the Philip K. Dick, you know, story, which is that the replicants are, you know, the, the bot replacements for humans. But um, this weird thing in all the sci-fi, you know, of the, the, the bot revolution, uh, there's a video game that's out that's very popular called Detroit. And it's very much like the AMC TV series Humans, which is about the when the AI bots are introduced to be, you know, house cleaners and sex bots and all this stuff, they re they rebel, right? Surprise, surprise, they have to start the bot revolution. That's what Blade Runner 2 was, the bot revolution. Uh, and it's all about how the humans are bad, so we have to dehumanize humans and we humanize the bots, right? And so this is being done also as part of that transhumanist agenda. And by the way, this fits with this because what do all the vegans say? Just like the radical green agenda, just like the environmentalists and just like the transhumanists, humans are the problem. We are the psychopathic serial killing you know, machines. Oh, look at how the bots operate. The bots don't kill. The bots are, I mean, quite literally, they're, 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 they're think about AI, Spielberg's AI, right? Uh, uh, David is the good kid. And the actual human who's crippled is just a complete brat shithead, right? And they always name it David in these films, too. Why do they always go with the David as a name? With uh, Prometheus as well. It was also David was the Oh, bot. good point. 
Yeah. I wonder why why they're using David as the bot. It's kind of an interesting twist there. And and why and why are these uh, you know these occult they well, they call themselves atheists, but the people who are actually putting this out like obviously Ridley Scott is very very well versed in the occult. Um, as so yeah, why why are they so obsessed with these uh, these biblical narratives and inverting them in certain ways? It's kind of interesting. Because they are, because in the the Crowleyan view or the Gnostic view or the esoteric view, uh, they believe they have this special insight into how to secretly read the Bible. Uh, the history of Christianity, history of Orthodoxy, they all got it wrong. goes back to, to Irenaeus. When Irenaeus wrote Against Heresies, he writes about the Gnostics and how they had these very elaborate inversions. They basically just invert everything. This is why the God of the Old Testament is the evil creator God, and Jesus takes on a new role of being a Luciferian Gnostic liberator. This is this is quite literally, the, this is the Gnostic tradition. So um, that's why they they like that. Crowley did this too, where he thought that the the Book of Revelations was a secret magical text, and you could reenact what's going on in Revelation to literally bring about the end times, the final aeon. Yeah, and so if you read like Freemasonic literature, Freemasonry, it's the same thing. Which you know, yeah. Freemasonry is just kind of a jumbled together, you know, uh, piecemeal right. cults. You know, using alchemy and you know ancient Egyptian symbolism, Gnosticism, and a lot of different things. Somebody's trying to say that that's not Gnosticism. That's not Gnosticism. In the no, uh, Albert Pike says that, that in Morals and Dogma that uh, masonry is summed up in the teaching of the ancient Gnostics. Right, and he, I guess, well, this person, the causation, he's saying that what you said is Gnosticism. It's not Gnosticism. He says it's not. No, know. it absolutely is. I've, I've read the Gnostic texts, and I have— have read the Nag Hammadi spent, texts and stuff like that is what these people believe. Absolutely it is. Of course it is. It, they absolutely teach that the God of the Old Testament is Yalda Baoth. He's uh, the evil creator God. This is what Marcion taught. This is what Valentinus taught, famous Gnostics. Um, and uh, the there's different strands, by the way, of Gnosticism. So, you know, you've got like the Pistis Sophia— You've got the the Gospel of Thomas. There's all kinds of different variants on Gospel this. Gospel of and Judas and stuff like that. And you have like there, John yeah, Lash. Like a lot of people follow John Lash. Tons of different Gnostic sects. But the general thesis, I have a whole talk that's got a good, good amount of views about uh, Gnosticism that pe people can go listen to if they, they doubt that. I, but I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who follow modern Gnostic teachers like John Lash or uh, Mark Passio and stuff like that. And they they all teach the same thing. Someone says David Icke is a Gnostic. Yeah, another Gnostic guy. David yeah, Icke. in many ways he is. Yeah, he is. But you know, if you read Albert Pike, you know, the that was one of the the that was a trip reading that book. I found in, in a used bookstore. I found Morals and Dogma after finding the Secret Teachings of All Ages from Manly mm -hmm. P. Hall when I was in the university. Manly P. Hall says it's Gnosticism too. He I has mean, pictures and everything. He's like he's got, he's got a picture book for all the for all the dumb Freemasons. And this was like 1929 or something. He published that book and. Yeah, he says the same thing. It's yeah, I mean, you'll find the same trends amongst Rosicrucians, and and it and you'll you'll find you can go into the medieval Gnostics, the Bogomils, the uh, uh, um, Waldensians, the uh, um, um, what's the one that starts with the C? I can't remember. It's been ten years since I was studying Gnosticism, but anyway, um, this check out this chick. Maggie Q. Do you know who that is? I don't know these people. No, I have no idea what is that. I don't know. Fight, so, fight climate change with the diet. Yeah, well, here's an obvious one, right? Tie it into cover your nipples. Fight climate, climate change. That's this is what you're seeing now, though. Climate change and diet, and we're gonna see a lot more of this, guys. Um, you know, I mean, eat less meat to to save the world. Uh, here's Tia Maori, dude. Here's a cultural cultural artifact right here. Remember Tia and Tamara? Mm -mm. Sister, sister. Come on. Oh, was that like a Nickelodeon show or something? Dude, come on. <laughs> it's like, like, ni like 1995, probably. Probably like 95 to 98. Disney Channel? I don't know. What, no, it was like it? ABC during the day when you get home from school. There would be like Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. and then I Remember think, that? Yeah, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air came on, and then I think it was Sister Sister after. And there oh, were these okay. like two good-looking okay. black chicks who were twins. Uh, here's her just dressed up in just lettuce. Okay. Taking her passion for veganism to a whole new level. I'm just there's so many of these. I mean, you got Dennis Rodman. Oh, kid, John, go for you. Is he promoting veganism? Yeah, dude. Think Inc., not Mink. Is it's just PETA? So it's like it's not even veganism. It's oh. just dumb celebrities. What do you what do you, you know much about PETA? We talked about it last time a little bit. Interesting organization. 
Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of a front, kind of a, a shell thing for, I'm not sure exactly what, probably has CIA connection. <laughs> Eating meat got you down? Get it up. Go vegetarian. So, just, you know, lowest common denominator advertisements. The next one's really, really interesting. Let's, wait, it's over here. Just these, these PETA ads are so interesting. Um, PETA. Did we talk about last time? It, in, is Skanky Cyrus promoting all the same stuff too? Yeah, that's what I was pulling up okay. right here because this kind of okay. brings it all full circle with the, uh, you know, you the the new age movement. You've got the the former Christian girl, supposedly former Christian Miley Cyrus, daughter mm -hmm. of Billy Ray Cyrus, um, growing up in. I'm trying to find. There was a. Uh, Peta gave her a pig, as a present. There she is. And she did a lot of these oh. photo shoots with her, just very dehumanizing photo shoots. Weird. Yeah, butt naked with a pig. Yeah, see, I don't know about her. She seems kind of dumb, but, I mean, this is so obviously satanic. I mean, the, the satanic ethos is quite literally a very extreme version of that same Crowleyan principle that I was talking about, that you're all slaves, we will rule you. The satanic ethos is we are the apex predators. You deserve to be you know, crushed under the boot. Um, so all of this stuff is putting out that toxic message to make you a slave while the satanic elite will crush you. No, they're dumb. They're, they're, they're dumb. Yeah. And a lot of these right. people that, you know, Miley Cyrus likely has no idea um, what's going on. This poor girl is probably abused as a child. But then look at this right. sick, disgusting predator who has been outed in many ways. I mean, this guy is a serial predator, Terry mm -hmm. Richardson, um, you know, regularly taking photos with her and guys like Jared Leto and stuff like that. Um, and just very dehumanizing, hypersexualized images. And then you see, here's an article, PETA cuts open Miley Cyrus's little sister for ad protesting classroom dissection. So, I mean... Uh, uh, what, what, it what? is. It's being turned into... It's like... Cro it's weird cross-pollination with cannibalism stuff and the... the 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 uh, Marina Abramovich, you know, mm -hmm. cutting open people, performance art garbage. It's This is just... It's insanity. And it's... And, uh, what I see PETA as is just this really... I mean, it's... Yeah, they say they're about animal rights... But it's a total joke to me. I mean, I, who is. knows what the heck these people are really thinking? I don't know what's. They really weren't. they now. running the dog killing farm? Oh yeah, they euthanized a bunch of dogs. Yeah. You were telling me you had a friend that was, uh, you know, part of PETA. Here's, you know, Miley Cyrus with a pig mask, getting drunk, shaving. Oh, she's bleaching her armpits. Peter well, gives... you're the swine. You're you're like the the the, the masses are the swine. Exactly. Right? Exactly. The legion of swine. But. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was a guy that uh, he used to be he used to attend a church I went to. We weren't really friends, but he attended a, a church I went to a long time ago, and he got into Darwinism and veganism, uh, like radically so. And this was a long time. This was like back in the late 90s. I remember this guy getting really into that. And he went to work for PETA, and the story was he he got his job there because he uh, went into Tyson Chickens and like undercover farm, he filmed them, you know, with the processing and all that. Uh, and then Peter was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're a hero. So they gave him some job working at PETA. And then something, I don't remember what the story was, but something happened. And like he found out that, you know, PETA was like a fraud and it, it like devastated because he believed in this organization like a, you know, cult. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, PETA is some kind of, you know, foundation establishment front type thing. I don't know who runs it, but yeah, as you see the fruits of it, right? It's like what are they doing? Exactly. Constantly dehumanizing celebrities in like a weird ritualistic way. It is sexual. a weird ritualistic yeah. And and by the way, uh, this guy after he he did become a Satanist for a while. I don't know if he continued with it, but it was during his PETA period that he he was a Satanist. So I don't know how I mean obviously he's outer portico. This guy was an idiot, but um there there's there's a lot of connections between the PETA stuff and Satanism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, there's a lot of very satanic imagery. Look at this chick in the in a box. I mean, a woman in a small cage, a contortionist. They're making woman. a statement, yeah. dummy. 
Oh, yeah, it's so you, artistic. <laughs> if you eat meat, this is what you support. Right. Because animals are people too. Well, where did this? I think this is an interesting. Didn't the street? Where did the street theater thing even come from? Like, it, where where's the origination of the street theater as protest? Like, wasn't that a foundation oh. or Tavistock creation? Uh, well, actually, the Bolsheviks did this. Uh, if you read about agitprop, one of the earliest versions of modern agitprop uh, were Bolsheviks, and they would kind of have these travel uh, these these acting troops that would that would travel around, uh, and they would they would like picture the czar as you know the tyrant and all this stuff, and so street performance uh, is a, a a Bolshevik thing. That makes sense. I'm getting all these weird iTunes notifications. It keeps saying your iTunes library is. I gotta quit iTunes. Um, all right. Well, we've been going for a couple hours now, and. I think it's about time to wrap it up. We talked about all kinds of fun stuff. We didn't even yeah, get, man, it was a great talk. We didn't even get to talk about Bill Gates cheerleading, killing everybody. Um, but I think you guys get the point. Uh, from my perspective, a lot of the stuff you're seeing with this so-called green revolution, the creation of the soy boy, we're looking at social engineering at a grand right. scale that we've probably never seen to this level before, at least you know in ours and our uh, you know recent ancestry. So. Uh, Jay, any any closing thoughts on our conversation today? Yeah, my closing thought would just be um, I have a, a in depth talk on one of the top globalists, uh, Arthur Kessler, his book Ghost in the Machine, which relates to everything we're talking about. And in that book, he talks about the history of cannibalism and oh, it's not that bad. It was actually just a natural thing. And he actually closes this book by saying that what's going to be done on the populace on the populace uh, is a kind of dark alchemy. So here's a top globalist uh, literally writing everything that we've talked about today into into a book. Yeah, and uh, Jay has one of the best reading lists. His, reading, his recommended reading list as far as like research on geopolitics, philosophy, uh, Eastern Orthodoxy as well. He's got one of the best reading lists uh, that is out there. So you guys got to check it out at jaysanalysis.com. I still got to fix that, by the way. When I, when I had to save the website, I lost a bunch of the – Damn it recommended reading things but I'll, I'll have to fix all that eventually but thank glad you. i bought a bunch of books at your recommendation before you lost your website so remember guys i mean you we're talking to a guy jay dyer it's his, now. his website was deplatformed from wordpress with no warning nothing i mean there's not nothing there was no hate speech on his website there was no um you know no calling for violence no nothing porn, even nothing violent yeah, yeah. no nudity i mean just you know he was talking about philosophy geopolitics and um and, and life. So I, th I think it's really, really important that we understand that right now in this digital age, we are looking at kind of the erection of a semi gulag type system, the, the mm -hmm. digital gulag. Um, and, you know, so if you want to support legitimate content, uh, you might not see it in your feed on YouTube. You probably won't get notifications. Just like for some reason, nobody gets notifications on my channel, or at least mm -hmm. half the people that want to get notifications email me and say they don't get them. So, yeah. I mean, I'm not half as controversial with some of the topics that I broach here as Jay is. Uh, I don't bite my tongue, but, uh, you know, there, there are things that I don't go into. And we're going to see a time in the near future where we're probably going to see a lot more of this censor uh, censorship and people are going to be afraid to speak out. And I really, uh, really hope that people out there are supporting um, you know, individuals doing work and uh, groups as well doing work that is uh, beneficial to – to the, the the cause of humanity, you know, yeah. I mean, if, if the vegans and the green and all that has their way, they're gonna shut you down. They'll be like, no, this is a, a site that promotes, uh, you know, toxic masculinity and serial killing animals. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, you know, the head of YouTube is a, or the head of Google, uh, or the president of Google is a vegetarian. He recently uh -huh. remarked this out of nowhere for no reason in the middle of a speech in front of everyone. Said, oh, well, I'm a vegetarian. So I mean, you are seeing. Silicon Valley, um, you know, it's trans governmental organizations like the U.S. Soilicon Valley. Soilicon Valley. Soilicon Valley wants you on that Soylent slop. They want Soylent Green to be people. And we are being programmed into accepting cannibalism, believe it or not, folks. So CNN reporters are eating human brains. Uh, Richard Dawkins talking about cannibalism ain't so yep. bad. Sasha Baron Cohen. Uh, did you see that? Mm -hmm. You didn't see it? This is, you remember Ali G and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, I, I mean, he used to have some a funny guy. He had some funny skits, man. Like regardless right. of where you're at, he he was really good at trapping people into doing stupid shit. 
but he got this. He has a new show, and in the final episode of his new show, it's uh, he supposedly convinces a guy that he ate human meat. He serves a guy human meat in character as a chef from prison, <laughs> and it's like a semi funny skit. But really, when you look at it, it's a uh, it's an interesting. Um, Interesting little cultural artifact. So, yeah, Jay, I, I recommend you check that out. The last uh, episode of his show, it was on Showtime or something. Um, mm-hmm. I, I live in Ecuador, so I can legally download it for free. But, uh, yeah, you can watch that, um, and you'll find that very interesting. And, um, yeah, guys, so thanks for watching. It's been another episode of the Eat Me Make Family stream. Jay Dyer, you're always welcome on the stream here. You can have the keys to my channel. Just make videos and put them up here if you don't want to get banned on your channel. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but, you know, I really do appreciate you coming on, man. Jay is one of my favorite people on the Internet. And nice um, I appreciate the work you do. Uh, so, yeah, everybody, you're more than what you eat. And I'll see you tomorrow. I'll be uh, interview- or not interviewing, but just having a, a nice civil conversation with the guy that wears a sock on his head who called me an insufferable dickhead with an insufferable lisp. So I'll be talking to Vegan <laughs> Foot Soldier tomorrow. I really hope he has his shirt unbuttoned because I want to just admire that manscaping and his, his 12-meter-long torso, or so it appears. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, guys, I'll see you tomorrow. Vegan Foot Soldier tomorrow at 12 o'clock Central Standard Time. Go to Jay's Analysis. Follow Jay on YouTube. Send him all your shekels. And uh, I'll see you next time. Peace, guys. <laughs>